Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show everybody knows, the show everybody loves, the internet's favorite show, and your grandma's favorite couple of dudes. <laughs> it's the film tip. <laughs> we're back on this mic is jake on the other mic is edward and we're back don't forget like the video subscribe hit that bell notification so you get notified of every video um that we uh put out um so you know yes please if you guys are at work you know at, like we always say if you guys are at work your phone your phone buzzes you look says hey you know film tangents is premiering now new episode Go listen on the boss's dime, man. Monday afternoons, generally. Sometimes other days, you know, but, you know, you know. You know what the best thing is? I think the best thing is when you receive one of those notifications for like a channel that you really appreciate. You know, I only have notifications turned on, and I understand how this shit works with people because a lot of the time people would either just subscribe to a channel and and be like, okay, if I go on my YouTube feed and I see the video, I'll, I'll click. You know. Yep. Listen to however much time I, I can listen to. I always listen to this podcast at work. Um, I'm always like, you know, I spend a lot of time in my office at work, a lot of time just typing a lot of documents. And mm -hmm. I put this podcast on as background noise. And because a lot of the time listening back to them, you know, I make myself laugh. Jake makes my, my, Jake makes my laugh last a lot uh, at work. <laughs> so this is just like, this is just like how, like just having this shit on. You know, I know that it's like, okay, out of this eight hours I'm going to be at this job, two, three hours of it are going to be consumed with this podcast in the background. <laughs> and eventually, every now and then, I'm going to tune into it and snicker. <clears throat> so it's always a fun time, man. And But I know how it is with people because I only have, like, three channels that I have, like, notifications turned on, on on YouTube. One of them is, like, a tennis channel. This tennis channel called Game to Love podcast love those guys yeah and, <laughs> and they just talk about tennis you know i have notifications turned on for our channel um and a few other ones i don't remember the other ones but yeah yeah if if you like what we do and you enjoy this please turn on this notification because it helps us out and if you're listening comment whatever you want even if it's just like a little emoji we'll respond to them in the best creative way that we can because also commenting like helps stuff like this out helps the channel get around Exactly. And we promise we won't be one of those annoying YouTubers that starts the video like, oh, hey, did you know that 90% of people who are subscribed have not hit the <laughs> bell notification? <laughs> like, I hate those. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, oh fascinating. Too, you saying that made me still not want to hit it. <laughs> made me not want to hit it even more. That we're not, the promise that we're not going to make is that we will eventually, once we, once at some point, Jake and I are going to start chilling. <laughs> and eventually, these videos are going to be broken up with multiple ads yeah. for, like, you know, Duolingo and, like, you know, Curiosity Stream. Wix. <laughs> and this is going to be full Wix. of... Wix.com. Yeah, this is going to be... <laughs> what's, what's that other thing that people do? It's like... Um, Squarespace. No shape. Yeah, Squarespace. Like, the, the once a month shape club, the, the dollar shape club or whatever. The... Doing all of those in this podcast, eventually. Yeah, <laughs> that's the day you guys will know we sold our souls. But that's the day you guys will know we sold. We sold out. Exactly. But hey, you know this is we're not there yet. Yeah. yeah this this world was built by sellouts, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Exactly, and you, you listener, will get to a point in time when we get there. You're also going to get something because this is all you know an exchange. What you listener are going to get at that point in time is the ability. Of commenting and saying, I was here before those guys sold that. Yeah, exactly. Lucky you guys. I was guys. here way back in 2022. <laughs> I was here listening to them in 2022 for that fucking um, Waking Life video where the audio <laughs> sucked ass. I was here all the way back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was there when they had to re-upload the primer episode. <laughs> 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 that's gonna that's gonna be that's gonna be one for the memories my brother was there for that one my brother was my brother noticed he was like i spoke with him like the same day and my brother was like why are there two primer videos because <laughs> yeah, i had an unlisted and I was like, the oh, you know, the, yeah and I was like, oh, you know the other one the audio sucked for that one <laughs> so the new one the audio is better yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, well 
<laughs> well, Edward, this past weekend, um, I had uh, a uh, we had a family dinner. Um, my it was my uncle's birthday, and uh, Edward, I got a little, I got a little too, I drank a little too fast on an empty stomach before yeah. dinner started, Edward. And let me tell you, oh, uh, there was great a, stories. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, 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 you know, it's interesting, um, where topics can lead sometimes and they lead to jokes that, uh, you know, while funny, uh, may not be, uh, very appropriate when your, your grandmother, your two grandmothers from different sides of the family are <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> so what happened was, <laughs> so what happened was, you know, um, my dad was making these mixed drinks and, uh, you know, he passed them out, right? And like we were drinking them, and I just chugged mine down. So by the time everyone turned to me, like ten seconds after they all got passed out, they uh, um, all the drinks got passed out. That is, they were like, "Jake, how's yours?" And I was like, "Great!" And I held hold up an empty glass because um, I had finished already. <laughs> so so I got a little too tipsy. So um, you know, we're sitting at the dinner table. We start eating. Uh, whole families there, you know, uh, my parents hosted this dinner for my uncle's birthday and I came through and, uh, we're sitting there and we start talking about, um, oh man, how did we get on this topic? We started talking about Easter and, uh, something like that. And then I think someone at the table brought up that, that weird Peter Cottontail movie that I've spoken about and that we have a little short <laughs> up about on our YouTube channel. <laughs> And then someone was yeah, like, oh, right. you mean you mean Peter Rabbit? And and my mom was like, no, no, Peter Rabbit was the British thing. And my mom starts talking about Peter Rabbit, you know, and how uh, Peter Rabbit, right, was this little rabbit in the old cartoon. I watched it when I was a kid. It was like a little animated special. And Peter Rabbit and his little friend, you know, they're, um, <clears throat> they're uh, you know, they go to this uh, Mr. McGregor's garden to like steal his uh steal his carrots and stuff and his cabbage and uh you know despite their parents warning them and my mom says uh you know she's like well you know what ha she was like you know oh and peter rabbit and his friend would go to the garden and even though their parents told them oh don't go to mr mcgregor's garden uh because mrs he'll catch you and mrs mcgregor will bake you into a pie uh, and then at which point i had this brilliant idea uh, this this funny idea popped into my head. Don't know where it came from, but I'm assuming it was the mixed drink of like four sh four or so shots that I had downed so quickly. And I said, "Well, that's what the parents told them." But but in actuality, uh, there was no Mr. McGregor, and the reason that the rabbits shouldn't go to the garden is because Mr. McGregor <laughs> is into bestiality, <laughs> and that's why. <laughs> 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 and so <laughs> and so then then I have this entire table of people looking at me <laughs> like and they're all like trying not to laugh because they know it's like <laughs> inappropriate and there's like old 70 80 year olds at the dinner table <laughs> sitting with us but you know the younger folks at the table uh you know they knew it was funny and and they uh you know they were holding in their laughter um, and you know, my mother starts begins scolding me about how I'm making bestiality jokes while my 80 year old grandparents are sitting at the table. Uh, and, uh <laughs> you guys can't see it, but Edward's like holding in laughter right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, my advice, uh, if you haven't eaten, uh, drink slow, drink slow. Yeah. But other than that, it was fun. Other than that, it was a nice you know, time. You know? You know what the funny thing about that is that often stuff like that happens with me. Yeah. <laughs> and I I have thoughts, you know. Like stuff like that comes into my head as like thoughts. <laughs> yeah. And oftentimes I think to myself, like, don't say that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then I'm like, Don't don't say that. And you know, after a while passes, I'm like, good thing that you didn't say that. <laughs> but then there's like moments like you where I think of something and I say it. Yeah. And then I think to myself immediately after I said it, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, but it's too late. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't and then swallow times, the words back up. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, and then there's times where in those exact same situations, 
I say stuff, and then I say to myself, did I just say that? (laughs) And then somebody else reacts to that, and I go like, oh, boy, I did. (laughs) It's it's quite a tricky situation. I feel like like that's like amongst not the worst things you could have said. (laughs) Nah, pretty benign when you think about it. It, It's very much like a Louis C.K. kind of joke, you know, to kind of blow smoke up my own ass. Uh, (laughs) I would love to do stand-up if it wasn't so... Oh, nice. Yeah, I would love to yeah. do stand up if I wasn't so damn you know nervous about standing up in front of a crowd. That the idea of that just terrifies me, man. But yeah. uh, but anyway, uh, you had those something. Those people are fascinating. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was about to change the topic. Just <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were about to switch topics. Um, no, I was gonna say like that. Those people are fascinating, man. You know, because I always think about, you know, because I, I often make, as you know, sometimes I make a bad joke. And then I would say like, oh, you know, I'd be like, oh, I'm working on my type five for the comedy store. Or shit like that. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's fascinating stuff like that because it's like, that's true for a lot of these people. A lot of those people that were doing that, that's like so true. And that is like a thing that sometimes I think about it, you know, sometimes I think about it, like, oh, how would that feel, you know? But I don't think that's a feeling that I want to know how it feels, you know, <laughs> being like a stand up comedian. Standing up in front of people and making jokes. That's a that sounds like really tough, man. Yeah. That's a very scary thought. Sometimes those guys fancy, have balls. Sometimes I do fancy Yeah, no, they guys those guys have balls, man. But but I feel like it's easy sometimes, you know, to like be in a room of, in a room full of people and make them laugh and then fancy yourself a comedian. And be like, Oh, you know, I'm really making everybody laugh here, <laughs> really getting somewhere. Yeah. But no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my th- I don't even try to make people laugh, honestly. Like that's one of the worst things you can do. Th- those are some of the most annoying people uh we've encountered. You and I have encountered these types of people who uh you know, just try to make other people laugh. Like they look for they they're they're on the hunt for laughs. Uh you just got to say yeah. stuff that you think is funny. Cuz then even if no one laughs, you're cracking up and it's like, well, I'm having a good old time over here. Fuck you guys. That's that's my philosophy. Yeah, because then, anyway. then, yeah, then at least you can be kind of like a Kevin Hart type or like a Burt Kreischer type, where it's like I'm just here making myself laugh, <laughs> and I right. laugh in a funny way, and then other people laugh because I laugh in a funny way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is, which is funny because that, that's I remember saying to you that Burt Kreischer had been getting like hate online. And that's really what it boils down to. People are just being like, I'm tired of that guy fake laughing <laughs> with his own jokes. And he's like admitted it. He like has like, I've seen videos like, you know how it is on YouTube where like people will, people will make an hour video about anything. Oh, yeah. Give, give anybody a topic and they'll make an hour long, 30 minute long fucking dissertation. You know, so I saw like one of those. Um, and I, by see it, I mean that I had it playing in the background while I was doing work. <laughs> and just being like, why Bear Kreischer is a horrible comedian and human being, you know? And basically, you boil down to the he, he fake laugh, he fake laughs. <laughs> That's so weird. Yeah, people's uh, people's takes are getting out of control these days, man. I mean, fuck. I know, I know, we it's all have control, hot man. takes, but you know, keep them, you know, keep them, uh, keep them reasonable. Goodness, have a chain of logic. No, at you least. do. YouTube's out of control. That's something that I remember I had mentioned to you, like in conversation, like a while back, where I was like, I was like, dude, every time I go on YouTube, there's like a new Breaking Bad video, you know? Yeah. The Breaking Bad video that it's like new is just basically another video that already exists, but just like titled differently, or maybe titled just slightly differently. Whereas like a Breaking Bad video may say like, you know, uh, Breaking Bad is the most creative show in the world, you know. And then I'll go in there and be like, "Oh, Breaking Bad is the most imaginative show in the world." I'll be like, "Dude, <laughs> did I see this? And didn't I see this video? Like, it's just like unending. I don't understand that platform, you know." This is the moment Walter White became Eisenberg. No, this is the moment. Yeah. And then they'll go meta because yeah, then no, then yeah, I just yeah. saw a video a few weeks ago where it was like. Let's talk about the this is the moment Walter White became Heisenberg uh, trope. And like, this is the moment yeah. Walt actually yeah. became <laughs> Heisenberg. He was always Heisenberg. I'm like, oh my God. Jesus Christ. But they'll just keep going but, meta. They'll just keep stepping outside of the topic and commenting on topics like forever. 
Exactly, exactly, and that's that's like the 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 funny thing for me that it was like back in you know, I think about it sometimes because I was like at one point in time, people would make like a great piece of like you know visual media, and then somebody will write a book about it, and then yeah. somebody else may or may not also write a book about it, and then that will be that, <laughs> yeah. and then you will encounter some folks every now and then that would say something like. Oh man, have you read that book about that? <laughs> and somebody else would go like, nah, you know. <laughs> and then yeah. that would be that, you know. For instance, like I own books about filmmakers and like bo- and, like books about movies. Like I own like a um Andrei Tarkovsky book. Um I forget what the name of it is. But it has something to do with like sculpting with sculpting with time or something like that. I don't remember. It's just one of those books that just sits play, uh, sits somewhere in my in my house, <laughs> and I read one page of it, and then I was like, oh, Andrew Tarkovsky, Andrew Markovsky. You know? <laughs> um, but <laughs> but when it comes to like these videos, they're like endless, and I'm like, that's it. Is this even worth talking about that much? I don't think so. You know, I don't think so, dude. No. I don't think this is worth talking about that much. I think there's a video out there that somebody made that you probably just need to watch that guy's video and then be like, I understand now. You know. Because it's like, when I listen, like when I view sometimes like <clears throat> randomly posted like videos with like, you know, Vince Gilligan and somebody asks like, oh, Vince, what, what was that about? A lot of the time he says, he's just like, ah, oh, you know, I think I, uh, what kind of, what, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like, then, well, like, that was actually an idea that our uh, DP, our wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful director exactly. of photography came up with. And- uh, you know, it was quite by accident. <laughs> so. Exactly, dude. A lot of the time, like the way that he explains it, it's like in a way that it's like, of course, you know, yeah, because we do these things, you know, like we've written movies, we've done these things, and it's like a lot of the time with these things, it's just kind of a thing that you do. Some things are things, some things, but not all things, are things where you just like look at yourself and you go like, oh, aren't I clever? Aren't I smart? Aren't I smart? You know, yeah. I'm clever. Uh, what wit? You know, somebody will, will will say something about that. You know, most of it is just like some shit that you're just like, ah, it's just there. You know. Yeah, it, it's funny what you said. Yeah. By the way, I just want to uh, to comment really quick on Breaking Bad videos. The the guy who he he has made. So it's interesting. He's a YouTuber, and he actually made a lot of Better Call Saul videos. And he actually watched Better Call Saul before Breaking Bad and then recently I guess he watched Breaking Bad but he's actually a therapist the channel's called What's Therapy um if you're listening to this mm-hmm. open it in a new in a new tab if you're going to go check it out don't close us out no, I'm just kidding. but um <laughs> do whatever you <laughs> no, do whatever you want but um What's Therapy great channel he actually um very very intelligent guy uh, and he, you know like i said he's an actual therapist professionally and his takes on better call saul and breaking bad are really interesting where he's he's actually like bringing new insight that i've never heard before so the insight's mm-hmm. definitely out there but you're right i agree um a lot of it is recycled insight uh, absolutely look no further than the 100,000 videos about heath ledger's joker Exactly. Um, and the, that's like, that's what's fascinating to me, you know, like I know you mentioned um, Louis C.K. and we know a controversial figure. Um, obviously, we're not fucking uh, endorsing anything the guy does. But something interesting that he did was when he went to um, Rogan, he kind of called Rogan out at one point in that episode where he just kind of yeah. he was just pointing out that seemingly he was kind of like, you know, you know what I'm talking about, where it was like he was just saying, like, do people really need any of this shit? You know, and that's <laughs> that's that's kind of like my because Rogan is a meathead, obviously, but that's kind of like my my train of thought with a lot of things in life where it's like, you know, at some point, I think we're kind of over overindulging. In yeah. Things. And that was kind of that was like a that was like a topic that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I know that you wanted me to go somewhere else because you mentioned you were asking me this about something before, but like what I wanted to talk to you about that what was that was that that is just like this like <clears throat> I think when it with art and with creativity and with fucking analysis videos, you know, it feels a little bit like we are at a point in time of just like saturation, yeah, you know, of just just saturation. Everything is something, you know. 
Um, and I know that it's funny to say that as folks that are currently doing a podcast. Well, but, I've been thinking of the irony, but I, too. I, do, <laughs> I know, but, it's, but I feel like it's worth saying. And I know that at this point in time, also, podcasts are like endless, you know. Endless. There's a million podcasts about a million things. And there's a million film podcasts, you know. Um, but I think ultimately the point stands a little bit of just kind of being like, you know, Maybe there should be more podcasts where it's just two dudes making poop jokes and talking about <laughs> random shit. And then they talk about a movie like in the last 15 minutes of the podcast. <laughs> then there should be fucking people making the same Heath Ledger Joker video like a thousand fucking times. Yeah. They're getting a bunch of views. They always get a bunch of views. People are always <laughs> watching those things. Yeah. People, the people listening are like, these guys are so... These guys are coping right now. <laughs> <laughs> we are coping, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Just you guys wait. We'll be, we'll have more than 150 subscribers one day. <laughs> no, people uh, one one thing up, I, man. Like people, go ahead. I was going to say one thing I was going to say too. You, you brought up a great point about books, dude. People are like nonfiction books these days. I'm not even talking about fiction books. Like, fiction yes keep it coming if you have ideas like churn those fuckers out man i'm all for it right yeah. and again i'm not t stating any of yeah. this as as fact or any kind of prescription for anything this is just my feeling on the on the topic i'm talking mainly about when i say books in this context from here on out i'm talking non-fiction books and th mm. this is to say what i'm getting at is that the things that people and in I'm going to start, I'm actually going to pref, uh, I'm actually going to make this point by talking about a Ty Lopez video that came out a long time ago. Cause you know, Ty Lopez, he's that guy here in my garage. I mean, you obviously know who he is. I'm more so talking to the <laughs> listeners. Um, yeah. you know, for anyone listening, he's the here in my garage guy. And he always, one of his big, he's like the granddaddy of all the self-help gurus. Um, I mean, Tony Robbins kind of is, but Ty Lopez is like the granddaddy of all the fake like internet marketer gurus. And um, we, know, we know a few of those. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> uh, not nearly as successful as Ty Lopez and hopefully never <laughs> will be because God damn it, they're robbing people blind. But um, uh, yeah, CoffeeZilla, <laughs> calling your phone. Please. Man. Yeah. <laughs> We're calling out to you. <laughs> But to get back yeah. on track, like there was a video because Ty Lopez had this whole thing of like, oh, I read a book a day and that keeps me sharp. And that's how I became rich was knowledge, you know, knowledge. And knowledge. the thing is, yeah. I actually he had a video that came out a while ago that people were f like flaming him about where he talked about how to speed read a book and the, just how to get like all the mm. main points. And people were roasting that. him in the comments. They're like, oh, you know, uh, oh, I watched a minute of this video and I got the main points. And, and I think people don't realize that Ty Lopez is absolutely right when he's talking about nonfiction books. Like, dude, there are yeah. some nonfiction books that are worth reading every page. But, dude, the books that come out these days, man, where it's like the one rule, how to change your life. And it's like, oh, my God, this isn't a fucking book. All you need to do is tell me what the one rule is and I don't need to read the fucking book. Just tell me what the one rule is. Give me a couple brief like paragraphs of context. But Ty Lopez is absolutely right because he made the point that you can't sell a two page book. You have to fill up the the publishers like fill up the pages, fill up the pages. So they fill and I've read a lot of these nonfiction books, especially like in college when I was getting really into self-help and self-development and stuff and I needed kind of a, a starting point, I would read a lot of these books and dude, they are just, it's like they have these main points that could be pretty good, but then they just fill the book with anecdote after anecdote after anecdote and story after story. And it's just filling it up. You know, it's filling up the pages. It's very weird. And it's just getting worse. Mm -hmm. Like every time I watch Bill Maher's show and he'll be like, oh, you know, he'll have people on the panel and it's like, oh, uh, you know, he'll introduce his guests and he's like, she's the author of, you know, the two secrets to why America is always at war, you know, and it's like, oh my God, that's not a, <laughs> like the two secrets, the three, you know, the three things. And it's like, fuck, this is an article, you know?
Yeah. It's like, you, you don't need and to that, read all that, those. That Ty Lopez always... is absolutely right. That's... You don't need to read all those books. Well, Skim it. That was always like my thing. That was always my thing with those books. Because I, I always had kind of like a... I always had kind of like a little bit of like a... <clears throat> Like a chagrin with them or like a bias against them just because it always felt to me like, you know, like there's these things are just it's like the Niagara Falls. They're just always, always more, you know. Yeah. And I remember that you and I had a conversation about that once. And I remember that both you and I agreed with that, that I think I think both of you and I were kind of just like, yeah, that seems like this seems like this is really the way that you should do this, you know. Because it's like just overblown information, and you saying that made me think about that episode of Curve Your Enthusiasm, <laughs> where, <laughs> where um, uh, Jason Alexander, like George Constanza, where he writes a book, and it's like a little pamphlet, and like Larry <laughs> criticizes him, and was like, "This is not a book," <laughs> you know. <laughs> but the, the truth of it is that if those books were trying to be honest with people, it would be that thin, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. There's not that much in there, man. You know, there's not that much in there. And, the, and a lot of the time, like you said, it's just like if you if you just like read like the first and last paragraphs of it, you'll be like, okay, this is what this person's trying to say. And, and, and now he's this is what he said, ultimately, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I got I saved myself so much time <laughs> of just like a bunch of like, because then it just becomes like a bunch of like um, explanations. Oh, so you're, what are you doing? What's going on here? <laughs> then it just becomes then it just becomes like a just like a bunch of examples. They're just creating examples, 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 examples for yeah. every single thing that they stated, you know. It's like, yeah. okay, all right, I get it, you know. Exactly. And it, and it's not to diminish. I mean, some of the books are, you know, crap, but I've uh, there's actually some nonfiction books that have like actually not even to sound cliche, but they've changed my life in the sense that I started applying principles from them and seen like a, I think the book that to this day completely transformed my life, um, you know, at least when I actually put it into practice, which has with a lot of things has been pretty consistently over the past uh, like seven years now was this uh, a nonfiction book called The Slight Edge. Um, and I'll again, that, the, yeah, I knew, I knew that. Yeah. And that like that, that book is basically all about just doing a few, like whatever your goal is, just chunking it. So like, don't think about, you know, for example, writing a book, think about, I'm just going to write this many pages each day. And by, by, you know, by the end of it, you, by the end of three months, you have a book, you know, and, and it was, but, but of course it gets into all these anecdotes about like, you know, it's like a fable in there where these frogs get trapped in a bucket of milk and then one like, you know, paddles its feet for like a week. And then it's like the, it turns into butter and then it's able to get out. It's like, Oh my God. All right. But, but it did like, you know, <laughs> with writing, it changed my life where I was like, Oh shit. If I just write five pages a day, like I'll have a full screenplay at the end of uh you know two weeks or whatever or, or or like four weeks more more like but um but uh anyway i know you wanted to talk about kanye yeah yeah but it's, it's, it's like in the riff way because he um he's been in the news he's been in the news for a lot of things obviously another controversial figure all of these guys man all of these guys just end up being a controversial figure in some way, shape, or form. Um, so it's like when you're doing a show like this, it's like in, in, impossible to not mention some guy that people that a lot of people hate, you know, for good reason. But whatever. Um, he's been in the news a lot because he he I had seen pictures of him just like walking without shoes. He's like he was just walking like with his in his socks a lot for some reason in public. And I was like, what is this guy doing? It's a bunch of shenanigans and. <laughs> yesterday it was announced that he won like some kind of legal lawsuit that he had with adidas or like he were they were like holding on to like earnings that he had on like an account with them and it was like apparently worth somewhere somewhere around 75 million dollars mm -hmm. and reportedly he gained that back and i might be mistaken about this but i think he also gained he they because of that they also have to sell like and now I, I believe that right now as part of that suit adidas has to sell all of their yeezy like merchandise 
Wow. So they can't like hold on to whatever they have anymore. They have to sell it all. And I saw in the news that they were just like, if you go to like Adidas or whatever, they're selling them like at a discounted price. Wow. So those shoes that at some point were worth like five hundred dollars, some of them were worth like thousands of dollars. Now you can buy them for like apparently very cheap because um, the brand's not worth anything. But I do believe that that stuff's gonna be worth a lot of money at some point. Like even if you buy it now for twenty bucks, I think that stuff is gonna be worth like a lot of money at some point. Um, and bet. I think he has like the brand back. I think he has like ownership of that brand again. So <clears throat> maybe things are not going too bad for him. I think today is also the fifth anniversary of an album that I think you can remember when it came out and us listening to it. And it is the Yay album came yeah. out five years ago. Is that, wow. how, does that, how does that make you feel, dude? <laughs> dude, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, man, time flies, dude. I, I remember that was the summer, man. We had yay we had daytona by push a t we had um kids see ghosts kids see ghosts kids see ghosts freaking was like that was life-changing man amazing dude all of those albums are now five years old yeah i need to go back and listen to yay because i know i didn't like yay when it came out um but i've gained some more appreciation slightly for that album um as time time has gone on i need to go give it a another college try um i think i think the thing with him is that i honestly think that he i think he's just a music i think he's a musical genius you know yeah so much so that i i do believe that some of his music even even like some of his like lesser music i believe that it like ages like better than a lot of the shit that might have come out the exact same year you know it's it, it's interesting that way because and I say this because I have been thinking about him. I I I'm I'm not like I've been a lot of news about him. I've also been thinking about his Donda album, and I've been thinking about the the Yay album because of like reflecting on it being five years ago now, mm. and somehow I can remember that so vividly, you know. Um, but it's been five years, man. Yeah. Um, but just like thinking about it, because as you know, I've been listening to, and I'm still listening to, because I'm trapped, I'm listening to Future. <laughs> and the thing about Future's music is that Future's music sucks major ass. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, Future's music sucks, dude. You know, so it's like when, when I think about that, you know, and I put that stuff into context, it just feels like such like a difference, you know. Well, so what do you mean? Like, after a certain point, his his music starts to suck because that's where I'm at. Like, I everything he's released post, you know, you know, post like 2017, I've just been kind of like, uh, it's, it's whatever, man. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's 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 literally where I'm at. And like, you know, I I I don't even know if I don't even know how. Like, there's not much depth. I wish I'm gonna talk about it. Like, if when I get to, when I talk about it later on, yeah. but that's where I'm at. You know, I'm like at a place right now with him where it's like, dude, there's like one good album in every like one good song in every album. Yeah, no, I, that's how I feel too, <laughs> man. I mean, he he became so yeah. formulaic and so comfortable. Um, and what I look for in artists is especially in, I don't know, man, in, in every genre, but you know, with rap, especially for whatever reason, I, I just, you know, I love artists like Tyler, the creator, like chief Keef, you know, who, who each album you're like, I don't know what this is going to sound like, you know, this is going to have a radically different sound than the last one, you know? Uh, that's what I, that's what. Ha- that's what makes me put artists in like an upper, you know, upper echelon in my book, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's just, I, I don't know. I can't, you know, when people would say like, Oh, future's new album's great. I, I, you know, people at work and stuff in the office would be like, at my former job, my, my new office is home office now, but um, like in my <clears throat> last job, like in the office, people would be like, Oh, you know, future's new albums fire. And it's like, I don't know, man, it's, sounds like everything else he's released for the past few years it's just you know dude's like s- making this music in his sleep yeah he really is he really is he's just sleepwalking i mean that that last album of his he's like sleeping in the cover he has like those like eye like covers <laughs> on and i mean that that's what the music is like yeah it's, it's like a great visual description of of the album <laughs> 
Yeah. And it's 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 strange because I think that just in the same way that we've had this oversaturation of like nonfiction books and this oversaturation of YouTube videos about the same show in movies a thousand times, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like the same thing obviously is like true with music where it's like. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, because people uh, people used to have to pay for yeah. studio time. You know, it's like anyone can make anything yeah. now. You know, uh, like you and I, our goofball asses, can sit here three hours away from each other, make a yeah, podcast exactly. you know, from our homes. You know, exactly. like, but that, but actually, 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 listeners, remember that Jake and I are doing this at a McDonald's. Oh yeah, yeah, my bad. In China, yeah. The table's just really long, so we're three hours away. The table was really long, so we're technically three hours away from each other, but we're in China recording this right now. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, but but that but that that's you know as you were saying that's the the, the thing about it though because it's like you know when you do these things I, I feel I feel like it's less egregious with YouTube because with YouTube it's like people's choice you yeah. know people are spending their own time they're putting the videos online. And, you know, we have 140 subscribers and we're very thankful for you guys spending your time listening to us, you know. But I think it's fascinating when it's like that, whereas the difference with stuff like Future, you know, it's that the dude's just making horrible music. <laughs> and, and, and it's like being pushed onto the masses, yeah. you know. There's like a bunch of money being spent. There's a bunch of like carbon footprint being like introduced into the atmosphere just like on getting this dude out there and it's like it's it you know in my head it's like is it worth it you know yeah and i don't think it is you know i think it's just some garbage yeah i mean it yeah it's like i said i mean i've said this before to you i think like off the air but i mean i you know like in my last job when i would go into the office you know you'd have like uh you know i got promoted in my last job to like more of a managerial position and you know, like some days I would have, we would play music on the speakers, you know, in, in the, uh, in the, in the center in, in, in the office space. And, uh, some days like I would have control over the speaker and those were the best people were always like, <laughs> not to toot my own horn, but I will. People were like, Oh, you know, uh, Jake's an awesome DJ da da da. And it's like, yeah, because I actually took like 30 minutes to create a playlist that has like a lot of different stuff and it's not right. just the hits. And I remember like just sitting right. next to this guy, like God bless him. But he, he would DJ sometimes. And it, it was like, it would be like the same songs every day. And he would be like, I would look over at him sometimes and it would be like, you know, um, uh, for the night or whatever by pop smoke and little baby or whatever. And <laughs> it'd be like, you yeah. know, that song yeah. would play three, like three times a day. You know what I mean? Cause the playlists are so short and they're just these short playlists of like the new hits or whatever. And I'd look over at him and it's like the third time that day that that song's playing, you know, the 15th time that week. And he's like bobbing his head to it. I'm like, how do you? How are you even getting into this anymore? You're like, I'm you sick to death of this song. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know. But it, it, it's interesting, you know, because it's interesting because I, I feel like you know, I, I get kind of tired of, of these things every now and then. Even music, honestly, I know that I've been basically listening to like music every single day and like all these new artists and all these new albums and all this shit. But it's like, for instance, like the past week, I really haven't been listening to like, I've list, I haven't listened to like new music. And on my, on, 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 during the time that I've not been like driving my car somewhere, I've not listened to music at all. Yeah. The shitty thing is that like you're basically driving your car every day, so you're listening to music every day, in a way. But you gotta stay away from these things, man. You know, I feel like I, in a way, like in a way, in that same way, I feel like I've been in some kind of like film sabbatical where I just kind of got spent, you know? Yeah. Where it's like, I just, you know, I went to school for four years, and while I was in school, all those four years, I was watching movies every day. Yeah, film you know, school. During the summer, <laughs> summer watching school, films in class. Exactly, and during the summer, sometimes I would watch, sometimes I would watch even more than a movie every day during the summer. Sometimes, in the, sometimes like in a summer, I would watch like two hundred movies. You know, damn, watch movies. <laughs> and I mean, you remember this? I would, just, I would just be logging all those fucking movies out there, and I feel like, in that sense, I feel like I've gotten to a point with that stuff where it's like I can watch one of these. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like I can watch enough movies to have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, you know, but I cannot. You know, but I don't pursue them like that. You know, in the same way that I don't watch those like videos about movies or ch- shows anymore, where it's like, oh my god, man. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like sometimes I, I, you know, I like, you know, look, I watch interviews of like tennis players and stuff like that. Like that's really what I spend a lot of my time these days doing. Is like watching sports. You know, something that I, if I looked at myself back when I was like a teenager, I hated sports. And now I'm in my mid twenties and like, you know, I love tennis. Yeah. And that's kind of like why I spend a lot of my time doing. And sometimes I interview tennis players and they're like, oh, you know, after you're done with a match, like, do you watch other matches? You know, like, they're like, no, man. (laughs) (laughs) And that's exactly how I feel like about film sometimes where I'm just kind of like, it just inhabits my being so much. That when I think about doing more of it, I have to. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One, the one film for the podcast is enough. <laughs> now, I mean, yeah. I think it's hel- that's healthy, man. That's healthy. You know, yeah. I mean, there's like you said, there's such an oversaturation of like art and just media in general these days. You just gotta like unplug, man. I mean, that's why you know, I don't care how big of a nerd you are. I mean, I'm like one of the dude. I'm like. <sighs> such a fucking nerd like i'm one of the biggest nerd i swear sometimes i think i'm like one of the biggest nerds on the planet like in terms of you know just like i'll be like sitting down sometimes and i'm <laughs> like you know in the evening and it's like oh i'm watching a youtube video about godzilla movies and i'm just like i'm a fucking nerd man and it's like you know what i don't care how big of a nerd you are man you gotta just you know you gotta unplug sometimes and go live man i mean that i've made it a habit this year like any weekend that I'm not doing, like I have nothing on the books. Sat if it's a Saturday and it's nice out, dude. I just take my dog and I just fucking leave. I just go drive to a mountain and hike. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you know, I just try to like you know, because we're just all you know. And, and these are tired points, obviously. In not on this podcast, but just in any walk of life, we all know this at this point. Where it's just like you know we're just inundated these days with pop culture and media and videos and our phones are just glued to our faces all day. And it's like, man, you just gotta, you just gotta unplug, you know, go to the gym, go do some, I I do martial arts, you know, go hiking, go fucking fishing. Like, you know, I just worked like last week I worked from the lake, you know, and I was just like, I'm just going to freaking works over. I'm going to go swim and kayak and, you know, fish. And watch the otters build a dam under the dock, <laughs> you know, or whatever they do, <laughs> building a nest. I know I don't think I don't know if otters build dams, but you know what I mean. They build nests. <laughs> but yeah, that's the funny, you got to unplug. Like what, it, it's healthy, man. It's healthy. Yeah, no, it is, and that's what's funny, like about what um, what's her name? Um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Doja Cat. Um, she was like, uh, you know, there was some controversy with her a couple weeks ago. Because she posted something along the lines, because people were like wondering, like if she was going to be making music or whatever, and she just said on Twitter, she like tweeted saying, like, um, it was something along the lines of, like, I've made all of this mediocre music that you guys just swallowed it up, <laughs> and now I have enough money and time to just not have to do anything anymore except for being outside, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. hanging out with my family. And people got like really mad at her for that, but I was like, "Ah, she's right," you know. Yeah, she's right. I never, I never liked her music to begin with. I always kind of thought it was like, you know, just mediocre pop music. And she said it herself, and then she was like, "All I wanted to make with this music was just to make money." And I was like, "Oh, I respect, I respect that," because it's like, you know, if you can somehow just like win at life, and in this life, that's very much winning. Just being able to get off the fucking hamster wheel and being like, oh, now I have all of the time to just do whatever I want to do." You know, I was like, great, good for you. Yeah. You know, no hate on my behalf. <laughs> you know, Edward, I, uh, this isn't my hill to die on, but I actually disagree with you that her music is mediocre pop music. I actually fuck with Doja Cat to, to be completely honest. Like, you know, <laughs> you can laugh at me. <laughs> Edward's laughing right now. But, uh, <laughs> but like, I actually like her music. I think it actually rises above mediocre pop music because I hate pop music, dude. I hate pop. You know, I can't stand like I never listen to the radio, dude. Katy Perry, you know, 
flow ride, all that bullshit. I can't stand that stuff, man. But I don't know. Doja Cat has like, there's some neat, there's some, there's a lot of ear candy in her music that I kind of like. I'm going to be honest. I can't lie. Well, just like, just like that's not your heel to die on. This is also not my heel to yeah. fight for. <laughs> right, <Because> right. <laughs> I, I agree with you. I agree with you in the sense that, that there is a catchiness to it. Sometimes I do always kind of find myself. You know, doing a little bit, a little bit of the of the of the finger snap, <laughs> the jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But other than that, you know, like I don't, I don't have a great opinion on it. I just never had a high opinion of it. So the fact that she said that, I was just like, oh, you know, I always kind of thought that. The thing that I kind of applauded her for was just kind of at least expressing how she felt because maybe she just feels that way about her own music, um, which it happens. A lot of artists have really low opinion of their own art, but. The thing with me for her was just that she was just like so straightforward about being like, I just wanted to make money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to make money. I just wanted to be rich. You know, I just wanted not to have to to go to McDonald's from nine to five. You know, yeah. Can't blame her for that. Dude, yeah. I I saw this to to switch tangents here. I saw a really funny video uh, this past week. Um. And and this I think this is an old video, but it's uh, the the uh, George Bush Freudian slip. Have you seen that video? Oh, I I believe so. <laughs> I believe so. But like, could you go into detail? But I don't remember. This was like a year ago. I can, I'm going to play it real quick into the mic, like from my phone here. Sorry, an ad's playing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so funny, dude. But he like he's talking about the the war in Ukraine or whatever. And there's like a Freudian slip oh, that you're gonna hear. Yeah, it's like that thing about how like he like admits or something to like <laughs> something like is that what it is? Like, well, he just says I'm gonna like, play a, it. like uh, I'm gonna play yeah. it. I'm gonna play it. But this is probably like old news. People are probably listening to this. Like, why? I'm not saying it as a news thing. I'm just saying it's something funny that I found that I thought was hilarious. I'll play it here. Can you hear that? Russian elections are rigged. It's not. Political opponents are improved. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eliminated. Yeah, I can hear All right, I'm going to start it. Contrast. Russian elections are rigged. Political opponents are imprisoned or otherwise eliminated from participating in the electoral process. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. <laughs> I mean, of Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, of Ukraine. Yeah. 75. Yeah. <laughs> That's I remember so funny, that. Man. When that came out, it was like huge. Everybody, everybody was like making fun of that because it was like, dude, you admitted it. <laughs> like, you, he knew like, it the whole time. Live. Oh, yeah, Iraq. Be- ah, I mean, um, the people in the comments were like, it's so weird how everybody's like laughing about it. Like, oh, silly George Bush, silly old man. When like a bunch of people just died because of our want for oil or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> our desire yeah. for oil. That's a funny one. It's always That's about weird, oil, though. Like, all that shit in, in the Middle yeah. East. Like I watched a video, uh, Jake Tran. He's kind of a controversial YouTuber, but he's got some really interesting documentaries that he does on YouTube, like mini documentaries. What's and, his name? Jake Tran. Um and Jake Tran. Yeah, he's he's controversial cuz he's also he does like weird shady marketing things with NFTs and stuff or, or whatever those are called. Um uh, but Yeah, that is stuff. Yeah, but he has he has some interesting mini documentary uh, mini documentaries about crime, uh the military industrial complex. I find that stuff all that stuff kind of interesting. But he has one about how you know like a lot of our wars in the middle east or like all of them pretty much are just somehow connected to uh oil in some way and then i think i can't remember damn it i wish i could remember exactly what it was but they had um oh yeah they had something called and i don't know if this was in the i think this might have been the i'm not i I, guys for, for people listening i apologize i'm not that into politics or or like recent history or whatever like I'm not all that into that stuff, but there was some, it was like operation, uh, 
Iraqi liber uh, liberation. And they were like, no, we can't use that because the act, it spells out oil. <laughs> like it's, it's O I L operation Iraqi mm-hmm. liberation. And they're like, we can't do that. Cause then it's like way <laughs> too obvious that it's all about oil. <laughs> that was fucking yeah, hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Operation oil. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. That's hilarious. So funny, man. Uh, but anyway, That's man, hilarious. that shit made me laugh. Uh, what you got, man? Do you got any movie well, topics dude, that you want to go over? Before that, I wanted to I wanted to say this to you because I don't know if you knew about this. Oh yeah, but our man, um, our man that maybe should be as relevant as future is today, um, if maybe a coin flip have gone his way, but Mister Fetty Wap, oh yeah, um, was sentenced to six years for trafficking drugs. Yeah, how how many six? I have it in my notes too. Yeah, six years, dude. Six years for old Fetty. For old yeah, Mister Seventeen Thirty Eight himself. Yeah, that's crazy. yeah, dude. Mister Mister Fetty, Mister Fetty Webb took an L. It was funny because I like I can't think about his name anymore the same way after like that Cardi B Wap song came out. <laughs> Oh God! So that's the thing. <laughs> I think I yeah I I think that's in my subconscious as well. Was it you that sent me that? that he got was that you that sent me that that he got six years? I don't think I sent it to you because I I wrote it down specifically like to talk about it like in the show. Okay. Um. So it might have not been, but I but he did get six years. Okay. Because I saw. Uh, okay. I think I saw that on Facebook. I wrote it down too to talk about on the show. Yeah. It's a shame, man. Um. Uh, Cause I remember hearing about that. It was like a couple years ago or maybe one year ago that he was in some trouble. And then we kind of forgot about it. Of course, because it's Fetty Wap, yeah. <laughs> not to be an asshole, but <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. but something like this is the only reason Fetty Wap's going to be in the news. Like I'm not trying to be a dick, but it's just, you know, it's true. Yeah. He was sentenced yeah. to six years behind bars in New York drug case. Why, why, Dude, why? I mean, why is he doing this? He's a famous rapper. What, what does he even need to move drugs for? I don't get it. Is there something I'm missing I don't know, man. here? I think. I think. I think it's just. I think it's difficult for these guys to get out of like to get out of the streets, even when they become famous. Yeah. You know? No, I hear that. Yeah, I'm. I'm not trying to be you know insensitive or anything. I I understand. You know, I get it. Like. Yeah. You know, because that's why a lot of, unfortunately, like these gangster rappers, they get killed after they're famous. It's like, well, because they're still tied to the gangs that they were in. Like, it's, you know, we've all seen the mafia movies. We've we've all seen Ozark. Like, it's hard to, once you're in, to get out, you know? Uh, Just watch Better Call Saul. That's what Nacho's entire story arc is about, is trying and failing miserably to get out of the game. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, not, not trying to be insensitive or anything. I guess I get, it's just, he, I guess the reason I thought that way was like, he's just, he's been around now for nine years uh, about, you know? So it seems like he would just be so far removed from that at this point, but I guess not. But yeah. Rapper yeah. Fetty Wap apologized to his family, friends, and the addicts he sold drugs to as he was sentenced to six years in prison Wednesday for his part in a bi-coastal narcotics ring. That's crazy, man. He was accused yeah. of driving to Long Island about six times in the spring of 2020 and buying kilograms of cocaine, then selling it in New, New York and New Jersey. I mean, shit, man, you're that high up. You you have people do that for you, I thought. Yeah. Shit. It's tough with these fucking guys, man. Because obviously the same thing is true with like Young Thug. Where like you, that guy was as successful as it could be, you know. Yet you know under the under the like in the in the back scenes he was just like you know ordering assassinations, you know. Because it's like what is it with these guys sometimes? But it's like uh, you know, obviously it's really difficult for a human being after they become successful like that to be able to leave like that guy. The, gangs lifestyle and that mentality and stuff behind yeah but it's always like depressing because it always feels like it gives such like a negative message to like the youths you know 
obviously to to be a little bit like um the utes to, to sound like a the, the utes the, the, My cousin, the, the utes i'm sorry could you could you say that again what did you say the utes, the, the utes. <laughs> the utes. <laughs> but it's it's tough with that stuff man because it's like you know it's it's just such a it's just such a sad thing it's such a sad thing yeah. To think about somebody making it out of like the trap and making it out of like a really tough lifestyle to despite the fact that they make it out still be operating within that and then that be their downfall anyway you know it's such a sad story yeah like it really is you know it definitely is man i mean and to kind of those guys. yeah to kind of build off of that too it's funny we're talking about this because i uh happened it just so happens I I actually watched you know that Vice series The Therapist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for anyone listening who doesn't, I do. Yeah, for anyone listening who doesn't know, The Therapist is a series on Vice that they did where the therapist would sit down. They were mostly rappers and and other musical artists uh, yeah. that a therapist. Uh, re- I really like that guy too. He see he's very just calming and like really got those uh, folks to open up. Um, he seemed like a great therapist, but uh, he would sit down with musical artists and, and just talk with them about, you know, he did one with Chief Keef, actually, where they talked about his time on the streets and in gangs and stuff and all the people he's lost and dealing with that pain. He did one with Katy Perry about her, you know, some of her you know emotional issues that she uh, she was dealing with um, in recent years. Um, and he did the, the yeah. one I'm referring to specifically is Freddie Gibbs. Um, he got falsely accused of, uh, of grape. That's the YouTube safe way of saying it, uh, that, that everybody's doing now. But, uh, he yeah. got, uh, you know, falsely accused by it was so weird two like two different women. And, and it was, what was so mm-hmm. weird about it that I didn't, cause I knew about this, but I didn't know all the details about it. And when he was talking about it, it was like he, he's talking about it. And, and what I gathered from it was that he didn't even sleep with either of the women. He said that mm-hmm. they, a few women, went back to his hotel with some of his, the people that were with him, some of his like you know crew or whatever, who you know some of his buddies. And one of them, they both were like, "Oh yeah, I had a dream." that Freddie Gibbs graped me and it, and, and they built this case and they were like, Oh, the, we're, you're facing 10 years. And he said he, he actually spent some time in jail before his trial and wow. dude. And he said when he, it was horrific, I feel so bad for that guy, man. Like he said, this sounds traumatic. Like he said he was in jail and the guards would like, cause they knew he was a famous rapper and they would like videotape him in his cell and be like, hey, rap for us, spit a few bars for us, Freddy. And they like put him in a a, a wing, a, a section of the prison with with like neo Nazis, guys with swastika tattoos and and stuff like that. And they're just making it. They just, like, we're doing it so that things would just be horrible for him. Yeah, it is horrendous, man. Which, which 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 you know in a way that's the sad thing because it's like the sad thing is that that guy was put in that position without you know being found guilty of anything yeah you know he had not had the chance to prove his innocence and he was put in a really horrible situation but you know what the funny thing about it is that i feel like if somebody was actually found of those charges i would actually be okay with that you know if you told me that it's like oh that's why they put this person who did x thing related to those things yeah they put them there and they were messed up i was like great Oh yeah, you know, dude! Good. If people said that about Harvey <laughs> the, Weinstein, you'd be like, "Awesome!" Exactly. Please put him exactly. with Cause with, cause, the, with the swastika guys. Yeah, because because somehow it just feels that way. In a way, with that, it feels like it's like, oh, this is like karmic, you know. But with stuff, but then when it happens in situations like this, you just feel bad because it's like, oh my god, you know, like. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. And and he made that point yeah. where he said, like, you know, I spent my whole life worked so hard to get out of, you know, this to get away from the streets and from the crime and from the bad shit. And he said he just felt like he was right back there. And then the therapist even brought up like uh, 
something where it was like it. Rem- he's the therapist said it reminded him of stories of free men, like freed slaves, being put back into slavery or whatever. And I was like, "Fuck, that's mm-hmm. like, that's heavy, man." And and that. And that's that's what I'm saying, like to you about that stuff. That it's like, you know, even with Fetty, I really feel really bad for that guy, cause see, it, it just feels, you know, it, when you see stories like that, it just kind of beats you down, cause it always feels like, oh man, you really. Sometimes it just gives you this like perspective that it's like, oh, you can't, you know, these guys just can't get out of it, you know. Um, yeah. But obviously, obviously, as my man Benjamin Clementine says in his in his song. There's hope. You know. <laughs> yeah. There's always hope. Yeah. You know. There's always hope. Yeah. This this guys will make it through. And what I find interesting about the Fetty situation too is like you hear a story like that and you just know that you know, like the Fox News pundits or something are probably if they're even if they were to report on this story, they'd be like, Oh, what an idiot, you know, driving cross country to transport co- cocaine and it's just like For me, I look at a story like that and I'm like, what were the circumstances actually? You know, like what? Yes, he made the decision. You know, he's an adult, but it's like, you just never know, man. What's the situation? Were people threatening his family? Like, were people saying like, you're still in this fetty and and like, you know, that shit does happen. You know, it's not all just fun and games. It's not like, oh, you know what? Hey, Hey, drug boss. Um, you know what? Uh, I quit. I'm putting in my two weeks. It's not like that, you know. So you got to approach these things yeah. with some understanding. I'm not saying he shouldn't face consequences for his actions, but I don't know, man. I, I think right. people just need to. And I know I'm straw manning. Like I'm, I'm kind of creating an argument that people aren't necessarily making, but I just I can predict. Mm-hmm. I can imagine certain individuals making an argument like that and. I just try to have the approach of like, let's just think about, you know, uh, there's, there's, you know, why this was done and, and what were the circumstances. And of course there's a line for that where there's certain crimes that are so bad where it's just like, all right, like who gives a fuck why let's put them away. But this isn't one of those. I don't think. Um, Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you a hundred percent. But that being said, Jake, um, I have a movie-related um, situation for you. Go for it, sir. We're in the... And that's this, right, everybody. We are in the film section of film tangents. We need like a little movie projector this sound is about, for this section of the podcast. Yeah, right? <laughs> boop, 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 boop. But um, this is about The Little Mermaid, a movie that I... <laughs> I heard um, about this. A few months... A movie that I, a few months ago, um, guessed exactly the correct date of when it was coming out. And I think when, I think when that happened, like, I think that episode was, like, recorded, like, in, in February or something. And I think you said to me, like, when is that Little Mermaid movie coming out? And I said to you, literally, May 26th. Yeah. I had no business knowing that information. <laughs> like, no business, you know. And I knew that information by heart. Because you're a because weirdo, that, Edward. As time, but, but because of that, as time passed, I found myself thinking, is that movie out? When's it coming out? And then I would say to myself, oh, May 26th. And then I would look at the calendar and be like, oh, it's not May 26th. For some reason, I've had this relationship with this movie where I've been expecting it. I've been expecting this movie. And this movie's out. I've not seen it. But... People are hating on this movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. I watched the, the I watched the critical drinkers yeah. review the other day. It's great. Really? He, he's People probably hating like, on this. Like he's review, my favorite this... current film YouTuber. Just throwing that out there. Continue. Yeah, I like him too. But I haven't seen that review by the way. But uh, this is a headline from a newspaper that just says the smear campaign over the Little Mermaid movie is so intense that IMDb had to revamp its rating system for the movie. (laughs) Now, this is because, uh, purportedly, the movie, in its short period that it's been out, because it's only been out, like, less than a week, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's been out since last Thursday. It's been less than a week. No, it's been, like, literally a week. Like, tonight will be a week. Yeah, Um, sounds about right. Since then, 
Since then, the movie has already had 33,000 reviews. And of those 33,000, 13,000 were one out of 10 reviews. So think about that. That's not, that's not to say that, like, that, that, that's basically saying that, let's say that out of those 33,000, 30,000 could have literally been, like, two out of 10, three out of 10, just, like, really negative. But 13,000 were specifically one out of 10 reviews. Wow. And because of that, IMDb just changed the movie's rating completely, and they just gave it, like, a site rating. Like, they themselves decided to give the movie a 7. What? So if you go on IMDb right now, it just has a 7. It has a 7. And this is what they said about it. They said, Our rating system mechanism has detected unusual voting activity for this title. To preserve the relatability of our rating system, an alternative weighting calculation has been applied, they said. So, <laughs> and that rating system, so they gave it a 7 out of 10. <laughs> how, how is that? I, I don't get that. That's just like rigging the, the game, though. I mean, you're just, uh, the, people, the people spoke, and then you're just like, oh, you know what? No, we're just going to. I don't know. It seems weird. And it just and makes me that think was Disney's got them in their that, back that, pocket. Dude, when I saw that, they gave it a seven. I was like, oh, you guys are bought. Like this yeah. immediately, immediately erases any credibility that this site has. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, dude, if you go to IMDb, they run ads and they run like Disney ads and they run Little Mermaid ads. So it, this is just about their bottom dollar. They were, like, they were like, okay, Disney's not going to pay us money. They're not going to pay us the big bucks if the movie that they just released has a 0 out of 10 in our ratings. So we're just going to change it to a 7. Yeah. And we're just going to blame it. And obviously, I, I agree that obviously a lot of the hate of this movie is most likely um, people just hating, you know. Whether, whether it be just hating because of like, oh, you remade this nostalgic movie that I love. Or whether it is hating because the movie is actually bad, or whether, in which case it wouldn't be hating, or whether the people are hating for racial reasons, which has been said that there's been a lot of kind of like racial tension with this movie because they casted a person of color. But yeah, but just regardless so, of all of that, just so know, dumb that people would actually be, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, it, it should go without saying. But I mean, you know, the the whole, um, you know, that's that's. That's so fucking stupid to to be upset that they're yeah casting a you know a, a person of color as Little Mermaid. I, I don't know, man. Pe- people people got to. I don't know. I, I don't even know we're, what to say. We're weirdos, man. Yeah, it's just yeah, so I don't know dumb. What to say about that I, I can't we're even. Weird, yeah, I can't even find my words, man. It's. A, I mean, you know. Yeah, it's just so fucking racist, dude. Jesus. She's yeah. a good ca- she's so, a good casting that. choice. I don't I mean I don't haven't seen the movie. Yeah. I don't really have any immediate plans to see it. I don't really care about the fucking little mermaid. I'm a right. 25-year-old man, but like, you know, I've seen the posters and I've seen the, you know, marketing shit for it and she looks like a great pick. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, with all of that, you know, despite all of that though, I still thought that it was wrong to do that, to just be like, oh, we're just giving the movie a seven out of ten. You know? Like I think yeah. that if they were gonna do that for that movie, they should have they should have either make it so that that specific movie didn't have a rating and just leave it blank. Yeah. You know, I feel like that could have been like a, a better thing than just being like, we are gonna give this movie a positive rating. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, weird. okay, then then what's the point of having like what's the point of this being something that people engage with, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's like you're just giving it an arbitrary kind of uh you're just slapping on a 7 and calling it a day. Yeah, that is, that is weird, man. I don't know. Yeah, these these you're right though, man. These companies are just fucking bought these days. I just looked it up. IMDb is owned oh, by yeah, Amazon, yeah. but um I could have sworn it was going to be like IMDb is owned by Walt Disney, but that <laughs> that would be too convenient. <laughs> <laughs> that is too convenient. Um, interestingly enough, on the other hand, it has a 68% on Rotten Tomatoes. And also very interestingly, a 95% audience rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Which I don't even know how that's possible. 
Because I feel like if people are really just hating on this thing, they would just be, they would be hating on this thing on both sides and not just on IMDb. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell? So you said it has a. N- but seemingly. That's so weird. Yeah, it has 68 yeah. on Tomatoes, 95 yeah, audience seem- score, like you said. Yeah, what the fuck? Yeah, it's it's very strange. And it says that it has a 95% from 5,000 plus verified ratings. So maybe that's where the caveat is. Hmm. Maybe it is that with I, maybe it is that with Letterboxd, for them to count your rating, you have to be verified. Hmm. You mean IMDb? No, and in, 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 uh, not in, in Rotten Tomatoes, my bad. Rotten Tomatoes, got it, got it. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know, man. It, that's a weird situation. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, look. Yeah. Let, let yeah, let's judge the movie on its merit, right? Let's judge the actress on her acting merit and her, you know, does she as a human being, regardless of her color, like fit the character? You know, like fucking hell, mm-hmm. man. I remember, I remember I specifically, like I had, um, uh, this, uh, you know, group of friends like in high school that I hung around with. And there was one day I remember we went to see, it was a long time ago. It was back when the spider first Spider-Man homecoming movie came out. And when we got out of there, one of the guys said, um, one of the guys was like complaining that MJ was black. And I was like, "Yeah, that's the last time I'm hanging out with this guy." <laughs> like, yeah. dude, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, he was like, "I didn't like yeah. MJ." He was like, "I didn't like MJ," and I'm like, "Yeah, you know, I mean, the casting Zendaya as MJ. It was a different take on the character, you know. I was like, ah, whatever, you know." And he was like, "MJ's not black," and I was just like, "Yeah, I'm never yeah. hanging out with you again." <laughs> like, you're a fucking idiot. Yeah. yeah. You're an idiot. Like this, so that stuff is like such small potatoes, man. Like that, it's such strange thing to me because it's like these are just fictional characters. You know, they're not. It's not. It's not like this is Martin Luther King. You know, and we're <laughs> casting Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> yeah. playing Martin Luther King. <laughs> like this is not. This is not what's happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is not what's going on. You know, this is, that is these a are problem. Just like cartoons. Yeah, that is a problem. <laughs> But this is just, these are just cartoons, man. Yeah. You know, these are just literally cartoons. Somebody drew them, you know. And they and they drew them a certain way just because that's what the large demographic of the time was consisting of. Because yeah. then, if you, you know, if you read, like, manga and stuff like that, the characters, surprisingly, yeah. oh, my God, you know, oh, oh my God, they're, they're Japanese. You yeah. Know? They're, How they're, could okay, that be? We don't have any <laughs> issue Right, but, we don't, but but seemingly like American audiences don't have any issues with people making Dragon Ball movies and and casting like some douche to play Goku and like <laughs> you know just casting like a bunch of like you know actors that are not Japanese. That's not an issue. It's always just an issue with people when it's like something. It's always just an issue with people when it's some bullshit like in their fucking backyard. You know that doesn't even belong to them. So that ball fell here from somewhere else, bro. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's an issue when there's like whitewashing and then it's an issue when there's um uh like we're talking about not always. There's an issue with fucking racists when it comes to stuff like this little mermaid thing or you know the MJ situation that caused me to completely cut ties with <laughs> that that friend, but uh yeah, I mean yeah. I hate when people say things like that too where you're just like oh fuck, man. I know you had a situation like that in college where you're just like fuck, I got to yeah. I gotta, I gotta cut this string. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah. Jesus. It is interesting because, like, when it's interesting because what I realized from that point, that moment, it's like, you know, when you, when it, when you, it dawns on you, like, I have to, <laughs> I have to never see this friend who is not gonna be my friend anymore ever. You know? Yeah. Because <laughs> then you really act on that. You're like, yeah, I can't see this guy. Anymore. Yeah. <clears throat> no, you gotta. It's say- done. <clears throat> Yeah. And it wasn't like an easy thing. You know, I was like, I, I liked the guy, but it was just like, I, I just, man, I was like, I can't, you got to have, you know, if you have principles, you stand by them, man. And I don't fucking, you know, I'm not trying to blow smoke or be all virtuous and stuff, but I don't fucking, you know, tolerate racist bullshit. And I want to be as far away yeah. from, I want that shit near me. Like I want cancer in my fucking eye. But anyway, Again, not trying to virtue signal here, but that's just, I thought that was interesting. 
Yeah, no, exactly, dude. Exactly. But we'll see. Interestingly enough, I do I do have like an inclination to see the movie. We'll see. We'll get see. nightmares I spoke from with some people that took get their nightmares kid. from Sebastian and Flounder. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, right. But I did I did speak with some folks that took their kids to see them. And they told me that they left early because their kids found the movie like really like scary and unsettling. <laughs> and it's interesting because I like and whenever I would see ads for the movie, it did make me feel that way a little bit. Like I like I would watch the movie and be like, somehow this movie makes me feel scared, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like the movie, like the trailer would inspire like feelings of like weird like bottom of the ocean like fear in me. Yeah, that actually kind of makes me want to see it now. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's why that's why I want to see it. That's like where I'm at. Like my head, I'm like, that's right. I think I should see this movie. Yeah, um, the ocean's scary, man. Yeah. I keep having, I, I, dude, for like a year now, I, I've have this reoccurring dream, like two, probably two or three times a week, that I like, uh, for some reason, I'm in like a group of people, and I have to swim to like the depths of the ocean in like a, mm. you know, in in some kind of suit that's gonna protect me from the pressure but i have to like swim and it, it, it's like terrifying and a lot of times in the dream like i'll 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 what i'll do is i'll be like all right i'm gonna do it but i'm gonna put like a a shade like over my helmet so i can't see anything because it's like because of the, yeah. the they, they call that thalassophobia or whatever like the fear of depths or whatever uh, yeah. so i can't yeah. see depths or see you know the meg or see like any of these weird freaking creatures that live down there i don't know dude i don't know i do not know how to shake this dream or what it means or any of that shit but uh, i i want to stop having it <laughs> listen the person listening to this put it in the comments <laughs> write down what this dream means yeah i know yeah yeah there's always like you know dude Whatever you go looking up the meaning of your right, dreams, right, means, there's always like 10 right, different... means you're a furry. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> How's that even slightly it related? Is... Well, that, that's what I was going to say to you. Like, it always is. And that's what, by the way, you were saying, too. That it always is like some random shit. Oh, you know? yeah. Like, really? That's what, that's what that means? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I get your point. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway. I mean... What? You said you need to move to Madagascar <laughs> and become <laughs> one with the tigers. <laughs> Edward, that's scientifically inaccurate. There's no tigers in Madagascar. There are Fusa look, in Madagascar. Look, I take all of my knowledge about things from movies such as Madagascar. Is that the name of that movie? Yeah, and it's a lion. Is that the name of that movie? But thanks for playing, yeah. Edward. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah that's, it's, a it's a lion. It's not a tiger. Man, yeah. I, I, still wanna... I, need to, I need to be watching. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I still want to see. I still haven't seen. When I was a kid, I saw, you know, obviously Madagascar one and two. And, and I never saw three because I think by the time three came out, I was like a little older and I wasn't, you know, watching like animated mm -hmm. films as much anymore. Um, but Same I, for me. yeah, I heard Madagascar three is actually kind of good. Weirdly Interesting, enough. Interestingly enough about that movie, it has like a, a, a co-writer of that movie was Noah Baumbach. Yeah, yeah. The same guy that wrote the same guy that wrote like Marriage Story. In the yeah, I heard. So about, I heard that's that an too. Interesting. Yeah, interesting little little salt in that movie for texture. Yeah, yeah. I think that actually made me want to see it. I was like, oh, interesting. This this might actually be, uh, you know, be be good, but. I don't know. It, you know, it's hard. The, the, movies like that just sit on my watch list forever where it's just like, same. it's like, when, when is going to be the setting for this? Sometimes I wish I smoked weed. Mm -hmm. I don't smoke weed, but I, I, sometimes I wish I did. Cause it'd be like, man, I would love to like, if I smoked weed, I would love to, you know, it'd be great to get stoned and just watch like <laughs> some animated film or something. <laughs> like I was watching mm -hmm. an episode of Mr. Robot, uh, and, and Joey badass is actually in Mr. Robot. And, uh, really? <laughs> yeah. And he, he plays like this. His character is very similar. His character is somewhat similar to, he's almost like a cross between like Anton Sugar and Lalo from Better Call Saul. Like he's just this really carefree, like hitman character. And, uh, the scene, I think the episode, I think I was watching the episode last night. Yeah. Where, uh, 
these characters walk into a hotel room and he's just in there like waiting on his mission to get started or whatever. And, and he's rolling blunts and he's watching uh, the land before time on TV. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I was, and, and I saw that and I was like, man, sometimes I wish I smoked weed. That'd be kind of fun to get stoned and watch <laughs> land before time. But yeah. as you ha- saw long ago, stuff does not agree with me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. For the anyway. better, man. For the better to take away from all this shit anyway. Yeah. No, you're probably right. Uh, do you have any yeah. more? Do you have any other film topics? I do have a bunch of fucking film topics. I have a bunch of them. <laughs> like an endless list of film topics. I'm not going to go into that. Yeah. <laughs> do you have anything else that you want to talk about? Yeah, I'll do like one film topic and then we can get into our recaps. Uh, okay. Let's I guess, uh, let me look at my list here. I guess what I could throw out there this week, um, a couple of underrated villains, uh, that section that I like to do, um, mm. you know, semi-weekly. Um I thought of a couple more, excuse me, this past week. And what I landed on were two, actually two foreign films. Interestingly enough, I didn't even mean to, but they just kind of popped in my head. Uh, One, the first underrated villain is going to be Mad Dog in The Raid. You know what I'm talking about, Edward. Ah, Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who's listening, if you haven't seen The Raid... Uh, the Raid is an Indonesian martial arts film. There's two of them, actually. There's there's two Raid films. They're lots of fun. Um, fun fact, the, actually, two of the actors um, are in... They're in John Wick. Yeah, John, John Wick, Wick 3. 3, right? Yep. They, they're, they're two, two of the fight yeah. choreographers and actors from The Raid are in John Wick 3. They're in the glass house fight scene where John Wick fights his two yeah, fans. Yeah, it's like my favorite scene from that movie. Yeah, and and I I believe that I think like second movie onward, those guys had some kind of like relationship. Like I think they were working choreography and fight choreography. Really? Um, in those movies, like I'm pretty sure. Like if not on the if not from the second onward, then on the third onward, because that third movie like really picks up. Like that third movie, like really picks that up, you know. Yeah. Um, and I love the raid movies. Swear by them. Incredible movies. Insanely fun time. If you're somebody that just enjoys seeing people fighting, if you enjoy choreography, if you enjoy great like fight direction, if you enjoy martial arts, if you just enjoy having a fun time, <laughs> yeah, those movies are incredible. So much fun, man. And and it's interesting that you say that about John Wick because um, John Wick, particularly three and four are when they started and, and two actually pretty much all of them, but the first one, like two onward started to have actually um, like better hand to hand combat scenes that I, uh, I thought particularly mm-hmm. three and four, they started to pick up a little bit in two, yeah. but it was still yeah. mostly the gun fu yeah. stuff. And then three and four, they really yeah. amped up the hand to hand fighting, which for me yeah, exactly. is more fun, uh, is more entertaining than the gun fu stuff. Just personally, I, I love martial arts. I agree. Arts. I personally agree because because my I've only seen the first three John Wick movies. I haven't seen the fourth one, but the third one is my favorite one because of that. I thought that it just elevated itself like so well, you yeah. know. Yeah. With the action. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so the the raid movies. Um, just to get into Mad Dog, you know, he's he's a good villain, man. In the first raid movie, uh, he's you know just this badass character. There's a scene where he has a guy. I remember that. There's that scene. I think he has a guy at gunpoint, and he just puts the gun down, and he's like, and he says, "I remember it." He stretches out his hands, and he like kind of wiggles his fingers, and he's like, "This right here, this is where it's at." Hand to hand, like hand to hand fighting, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they have that great hand to hand. Yeah, and he's formidable, dude. Like he's a freaking like dude, he's he's like an overpowered. They play him like an overpowered anime villain in that movie where it's just like, dude, mm-hmm. this guy is going to kick everybody's ass. And he's he's like a small guy yeah. too. He's like short. He's a small guy, yeah. Yeah, he's like yeah, Rey he's Mysterio small, size. Yeah, but he he like kicks he ass. Is, he is. And the final he fight scene. Ass. Yeah, the final fight scene the main character and his brother have to go two on one with them and they both almost die 
uh, yeah, great performance by that actor. Yes. Um, not, I don't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, but the raid movies are interesting too. Uh, for any martial arts aficionados or martial arts people who are interested in martial arts out there. Personally, I'm a practitioner of Muay Thai kickboxing. Uh, I also did Taekwondo uh, uh, in my in my youth. My youth. Uh, my youth. Your yeah, youth. I actually got my black belt in Taekwondo, and then did wrestling in high school. So I've been around the block with a few different martial arts, and I currently do Muay Thai kickboxing for uh, the past couple of years, and, and still do. Um, so I, I'm a big martial arts guy, and and I'm always looking at kind of different martial arts, what, what, which ones are the best for self-defense, things like that, which ones are the most practical. Uh, and the raid, the martial art that they use is uh, Silat, Silat, S-I-L-A-T. And what's interesting about that martial art, and you can see it in the movie, is that the philosophy of that martial art is to kill your opponent before he kills you. But what's <laughs> interesting is you, you could see that in the raid, like, because I, I remember specifically before I knew anything about the martial arts in that film, um, when I was watching it, I'm like, fuck, uh, the main character's name, I think his name's Rama. I'm like, this guy kills motherfuckers. Mm -hmm. Like, the, yeah. the, he'll have the guy, yeah. you know, down, like dead to rights, and he just kills him. And I remember there's certain parts in both movies where I'm like, you know, he could have probably spared that guy, but it's like, no, he just freaking like, you know, <laughs> he, killed he, him. Like, yeah, he guts yeah. him. Like there's that scene in the raid two, man, where Rama, uh, yeah. I always thought it was like a little overkill where I was like, oh, this protagonist is actually like kind of brutal. Like it's that kitchen yeah. fight scene and he's fighting off all those dudes. And then there's that one guy and it's yes. like, he's beating him. He beat him. And then he drags him over to the <laughs> stove and like, just holds his face yeah. down to the yeah, stove right. and like burns that's half right. his face off. And, and I remember, I mean, it's a cool scene, but I do think they sacrificed a little bit of like, I mean, not a ton of character like ability, but that scene made me raise an eyebrow where I was like, I don't know, man, he had that guy beaten. I don't think he needed to like drag that guy to the stove and like disfigure him. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's not, no, they, you know, they for those listening, for those listening, it's not like he dragged the guy's unconscious body or anything. Like the guy was still somewhat fighting back, but it, it was it's it one of those scenes where I was like, I don't know if he had to do that, but no, he definitely that was definitely like an indulgent moment. Yeah, yeah, for 100%, sure, hundred percent just indulgence. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and then yeah, we're kind of uh, just in the interest of time. I'll rattle this one off real quick, but um. Uh, the other one that I thought of was Lil Z uh, in City of God. Oh yeah, that's right. That that is that is an underrated villain. That guy is that that little kid, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, he's a great villain because it, it, it's a great example of like you know because the City of God, which anyone listening, if you haven't seen City of God, great film, fantastic film. Um, takes place in the slums of, is it Brazil? I'm sorry, it's been a while. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this, it is Brazil. Yeah, in the city of God. I think that it's a real city that's actually called, um, it's nicknamed Ciudad the city of Dios. God. Yeah, mm. thank you. And uh, so the, all the characters are growing up in the slums uh, around crime and everything, and they're getting involved in gangs and stuff like that. And uh, this character, Lil Z, who ends up being the antagonist of the film, he starts out in the film as just this little boy who's like just always picked on by people and stuff. And then there's that one scene where it's like he just had enough, man, and he just shoots that guy. And then he just and then I think they say something the narrator says something like and that that day Lil Z realized that he loved that he liked killing or he liked the blood, something like that. Yes. There's that fantastic yeah. like mini montage of him just like aging, and as he ages, he's like shooting something, someone different, like in each shot. So like each shot is him shooting someone different, and in each shot, he's a yeah. little bit older. Yeah. So it does like a time jump. I mean, yeah, it was like such a brilliant yeah. little time jump that they did. But so that's my other underrated villain of the week. Incredible, incredible. Um, like what you were talking about that I couldn't like, I was like thinking of underrated villains I couldn't think of any like the only, the only villain that I could come up to my head 
was like that. And this, I think I thought about this just literally just because of the movie that we're talking about this week. But I talked, I thought about that um, older lady in Prisoners. I don't remember the name. I don't oh. remember like her name in that movie. Yeah. But I thought about that lady. <laughs> oh, yeah. Aunt, it's like Aunt Polly or something. What was something like that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, me, my God. Me, yeah. Piece of shit. To me, yeah, no, Holly no, no. Jones. To, to me, that's that lady name. represents, yeah, yeah, no, to me, that lady, like that character represents like evil, you know, incarnate, like just evil, yeah, and that that actress like plays that role perfectly, where you just kind of was like, ah, oh, you know, yeah, Ugh. yeah, yeah, I, I don't think I've, there's like few times where I'm, actually like because there's different types of villains out there man there's like there's scary villains right where you're like i'm afraid yeah. of this villain right then there's villains yes. like you know uh i gotta bring him up so much but i i can't help he's like one of the greatest villains of our generation lalo from better call saul where it's like you love to hate him yeah. you know he's like i love to hate that guy right you know he's great like he's right. awesome you know and there's even qualities about him that you like you're like, oh, look at this dashing man with his muscle car and his tattoos and like his charm. You know, it's like, oh, there's some cool qualities about him, you know. And then there's villains that you just fucking hate, man. And Holly Jones from Prisoners. Great, great pick, Edward, because, yeah, yeah I remember when you and I first watched. You had already seen that movie, but it was my first watch. And we were watching it together like I just. Every time that reveal happens and she's got, um, you know, the main character at gunpoint or whatever, I'm just like gripping. I just want to like do it. I just want to reach through the screen and freaking strangle her, man. Ugh, mm -hmm. horrendous. Yeah, great pick. Yeah, no, that that, but that that's where I have like a tough time with that movie because like I've seen that movie two times. The time, no, it's only three times actually, and every single time it's just when it gets to that point in the movie, I'm always just like so overcome with like emotion, you know. Yeah. And somehow with that movie, it always feels like I can't release, I can't like fully, I can never fully release those emotions, you know. Yeah. Maybe I need to rewatch it and see how I feel. But I mean, I don't know how I would feel watching this movie again, particularly like specifically because of the events of my life in the, over the past, you know, like year or so. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, but I, it'll be interesting for me to rewatch it and just see where I land <laughs> with it. Because yeah, that movie is tough, man. Always tough as fucking nails. Yeah. No, it is rough, man. Yeah. It's probably one of the darkest films ever made. I mean, you know, just in terms of. Uh, you know, tone and, and subject matter wise. Um, yeah. One of, one of the probably bleakest films, but it, it's a masterpiece, dude. Directed by the same guy who's yeah. film we're reviewing this week. Uh, Denis Villeneuve. Yes. Yes. Denis Villeneuve. But Edward, hit us with your recap, yes, sir. man. Well, interestingly enough, I actually watched some movies. Because Whoa. we talked about future, I'm not gonna. I know, I know, right? <laughs> um, because we talked about future, I'm not gonna go like in depth about him. Um, I probably will like in the next one because I just haven't finished like his discography. What I'm trying to, um, I listened to these future albums. I listened to Purple Rain, which was a, an interesting one. Like wh when I looked at Purple Rain, that's really when I convinced myself that I was just going to listen to all his albums. I was like, I was just going to do it. This is just what's going to happen. <laughs> do it. <laughs> I listened and to that Purple song. Rain. You I think sent I sent me. you a song from it. Yeah, I listened to that. Yeah, um, and it's inter it's interesting because Purple Rain is a twelve track song, off of which nine songs are garbage. <laughs> and this is where the this is where it all starts with the future. Because then Perk is calling the song Purple Rains and the song News or something. I think that's one that I sent you. Those songs are actually pretty good. I, I enjoy those songs. They feel like they have something to them. Um, I listened to Evil, the 2016 album. And, dude, I have, I, have, I, have nothing, I have nothing positive to say about that album. Only that um, Low Life and Wicked are, are, are good songs. Yeah. And that goes without saying, you know. 
And Low Life is really a good song because of the weekend. Like he's really like he's really he's really pushing, you know. Um, he's like doing most of the lifting. But every other song in there, I'm not even gonna bother mentioning them. I like, think Future's, every other song in them, like Sorry, I, I just wanna say I think Future's verse on Low Life. Personally, I really like Future's verse on, on No Life or uh, on Low Life, excuse me. Um I think they complement yeah. each other really well. I agree. Song. Like th- th- I agree, but I agree, but like like what I'm trying to say with that is that I think that had the weekend not be in that song, it wouldn't have elevated itself to the level that it did. That's where I don't think he could have accomplished that on his own. Is what I'm trying to say. Like if you just had him doing the chorus and everything else, I don't think you would have had the same success. You know, um, but his 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 um, his verse his verse are good. I do think the song's like a little bit too long, and I don't like like the little like outro of him just going like oh is that is that is that <laughs> like. <laughs> oh, that's and your wifey, that, wifey, him making wifey, silly little, wifey. <laughs> yeah, and him making silly like silly little sounds in this album signaled to me clearly. I was like, this is where it starts, you know, because <laughs> he has famously over the past few years has been doing a lot of silly voices. Um, but I thought Evil was a bad album with a, a couple of good songs. I listened to his self-titled Future, and it was the exact same situation but there were better songs here mask off was good uh let me see da, 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 da. draco um go ahead draco that's a good one yeah Draco's a good one let me see um when i was broke sucks um <laughs> feds deep in the sleep used to do this with drake is also not good the mask off one with with counter is not good and extra love with yg is okay yeah um i agree also thought this was also thought this was a bad album, and then I landed in Hendrix, and Hendrix is where I kind of gave up a little bit, and I left him be, because <laughs> um, I listened to Hendrix, and Hendrix is horrendous. <laughs> like Hendrix is in like his like Hendrix is like in his in his like must to listen to or like his essentials. Yeah, it's Hendrix weird. Is horrendous. I, the only Hendrix song is horrendous. The only song I've even heard on Hendrix is coming out strong with the weekend, which I actually like. Besides the moment, and it's that, hilarious. Yeah, besides the moment <laughs> that if everyone listening, after you're done with the podcast, <laughs> go look up Kodak Black calls future. It should pop right up. Kodak Black calls future because there's a line on coming out strong where the like future says a line where he says something like the only time I feel alive is when I taste or something when I taste like drugs, but at the same time it yeah. lines right up with an ad lib and it makes it sound like he's saying, and I quote, only time I feel alive is when I taste dick, <laughs> which unquote, yeah. that was a quote. <laughs> Don't anyone take this out of context. I didn't say that. Dude, that was a quote. And the funny thing, the funny thing is that this is like such a blatant attempt at like a pop album on his behalf. Every song, Every song, every song is just an attempt at making a pop hit. I mean, dude, he has Rihanna in here. There's a song called Selfish with her. He has You the Baddest with Nicki Minaj. He has Pie with Chris Brown. Like, this was such an attempt in 2017 at making, like, a a pop trap album. And because of that, it's just horrendous. I could not stand it. could not stand this fucking album. Um... Every song to me was just, I mean, geez, man. Um, but coming out strong was good. And solo, the other start song, um, number sixteen. I thought about sending that one to you. I didn't, but I thought about it. I thought about it several times, including today, because I listened to it again today. Because um, I think solo is actually pretty good. Okay. Um, but there's, but it's just those two songs. Song number two and song number sixteen solo are good. But the funny thing is that solo. That's another one of those like kind of like you, you hear the lyric and you go like what? And this is why I wanted I wanted to send it to you because I wanted to send it to you and tell you to go to that time on the song. At about two minutes and ten seconds into the song, he says, um, let me see if I have it here. He says this. He says, Jumbo shrimp, hey, straight out of the lake, hey. Slipping on the boat, hey, wake up, take dope. A. But if you listen to the song, when he says that, it sounds like he's saying, wake up, take a dump. <laughs> <laughs> it, 
And no matter how many times I listened to that song, every single time I was like, what the fuck is he saying? Yeah. Because it just sounds like he's saying, wake up, take a dump, A. You don't want no smoke. <laughs> so I'm like, dude, what are you saying, bro? That's exactly. That's how I feel about so the coming out that. strong song too. That's all I hear now when he when he says that line, and it, it ruins the song a little bit for me because every that's what everyone else says too. Every time I have that song on, like in the car, whoever I'm with will be like, "What, what did he just say? Did he just?" Say? Hey. <laughs> Dude, that video. I'm not a Kodak Black fan, but that video is a freaking treasure. Where he's like, "Hey man, yeah. what what did you say at this?" Part right here. <laughs> so funny. Um, other than that, I listened to half of um, World on Drugs. What's the song that you wanted me to listen off of it, anyway? My favorite song off World on, on Drugs is um, Oxy. I like the songs that I like. Okay. Off, my favorites off World on Drugs are Oxy, um, Fine China, Afterlife, and Ain't Living Right. Those are those are the standouts for me. Okay, Afterlife. Okay, I haven't listened to Afterlife yet. I did listen to every, songs one through seven. So I listened to Jet Lag, Astronauts, Fine China, Red Bentley, Make It Back, Oxy, and Seven AM Freestyle. Oxy. And fire, the funny man. thing about this is, Oxy. God. The funny thing about it is that initially I put the album to play because I had it in my songs and. I don't know if you. I don't know if this happens to you, but sometimes Apple Music does this thing, where I will add an album and then I will see that album again like a year later, and it's the same album but it's like missing songs. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that happens to me with Apple Music all the fucking time, and then I have to like re-add albums and then put songs back into playlists because it like just took them out of the album that I initially added. Yeah. That happens so to I pressed play on. I pressed play on World on Drugs, and. It played five songs, and then it played back this number, the first song. And I was like, what in the heck? I was like, is this just like a five-song album? <laughs> and then I went in there, and I saw that it just did that thing. And because of that, I ended up listening to like just songs like randomly. Because in the version of the album that I had left, it had in it, it had um, Make It Back, Oxy, 7 a.m. Freestyle. It had Transformer with Nicki Minaj and then Hard Work Pays Off. So basically, it just had those three songs, like songs four, five, and six, and then songs 15 and 16. <laughs> I was like, when I, when I when it finished, I was like, this was horrible and short. And then I saw that I made a mistake. Yeah. So now I've listened to half of it. But my future journey continues. On the other hand, I watched a couple movies. Um, other than the movie for the week, obviously, which I have seen that movie. Um, this is this is my first rewatchable episode because um, I had seen Enemy before. Actually, not even too long ago, maybe like a year ago, I think I saw Enemy. Um, and then I I put it for us to watch because it's a short movie. It's a great movie, and um, I knew that it was like a Villeneuve movie we we're missing. But on the other hand, I watched um, Miami Vice. Hmm, I've never seen directed it. by Michael Mann. Starring um, Jamie Foxx and what's his name? Colin Farrell. That other guy. I forget what his name is. Colin Farrell. Yeah. Miami Vice, quite an enjoyable movie. Like Michael Mann had not, I know that he, I think people say that he lost his touch eventually, but Miami Vice doesn't have that movie. I think if you look it up, it doesn't have great ratings, but I do th- believe that it's quite an enjoyable watch. It has like a little bit of artistry in there. Um, it, it just has like a weird artistry and like melancholy to it. It feels almost episodic, where it feels like you maybe need to have experience with the show to really know what the characters are about. The movie kind of asks you to go along with a lot of things, you know, and just kind of just to be like, yeah, this is how the character's relationship is. Just just trust me, you know. (laughs) It's not a trust me in that movie. But overall, it's a good movie, I think. And I had a really nice time with it. Um, I also watched Ford versus Ferrari. Great movie. Um, by James <laughs> by James Mangold. Um, and it was a great movie. It was so much fun. It just flew by. It was three hours, and I had a really great time with it the whole time. Um, Matt Damon was great. He was kind of just playing Matt Damon, but he was great. And um, Christian Bale, as always, killed it. 
Um, really satisfying movie, really great, really fascinating, really well executed. You really enjoy that movie. It's like a really good, like, it's like a really, it just feels almost like classic. It's like a really good, like, weirdly, like, just like a really great biopic, you know? Um, yeah. That's really how it felt, like, really great biopic. Um, and then I watched uh, The Last American Hero, which is a movie starring a young um, Jeff Bridges. And it's also a biopic about this guy, um, Elroy Jr., um, who was a guy that started um, illegally like selling and, and transporting um, um, moonshine here. Uh, not here, but <laughs> a guy that, you know, he started illegally transporting moonshine in the far off state of North Carolina. And <laughs> um, he eventually started racing and then he became like a very successful and wealthy um, NASCAR driver. And that movie felt very quaint. It's one of those movies that has just like a one song as the soundtrack, but it's a really short movie, so it works. And the song, every time the song would come up, and it would only it only came up like three times in the movie, it really added like something. To, it just feels really homely, like really homey and like really like nurtured, like backyard like movie. Um, What's up with you and race car movie movies too. this week? Yeah, oh, it's my thing, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. <laughs> But no, I enjoy them. I enjoy all those movies. I would recommend anybody to watch any of those movies. I thought they were a fun time. Um, that's what I got, sir. Nice. What do you have? Well, this past week, uh, I uh, let's start on the movie side of things. Actually, let's start with music first. So I have gone down. I don't remember what. I do remember what what prompted this actually because. Uh, my when I was up at the lake last week, my sister and I were listening to like a bunch of uh, Playboy Cardi music, and um, that he ha you know he has a couple of songs with Chief Keef, and I was like, man, I want to start listening to Chief Keef again. And as you know, and some people listening might or might not know, uh, Chief Keef is in my top five rappers. I think he's a musical genius. I think he's super super. Just he's a legend. He invented an entire subgenre of rap. First of all, he inspired an entire generation of new rappers. Um, he's a freaking legend, man. He's one of the goats. Uh, and he's in my top five. Like I said before, earlier on the podcast, when we were talking about musical artists, like every album of his is he's like Tyler, the creator in that way, where every album that comes out, you're like, I don't know what this is going to sound like. There's a new sound, you know? He had one of the greatest like pop rap albums of all time, or, or pop appeal rap, rather, uh, rap that had pop appeal, uh, Finally Rich. And then he just was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm never, you know, someone, I think people were like, hey, what, you know, when are you going to make like mainstream music again? And he, I think, I believe Chief Keef is on record saying, I'm never going to make an album like Finally Rich again. Like I did that. It's done. I'm exploring other sounds. And everything, every album of his is him pushing himself sonically, trying new things. And, you know, it's crazy because when you keep doing that, you might end up in, you know, inventing like a new sound eventually, you know, that catches on. And, and he keeps pushing new horizons in rap. So I've been, uh, you know, re-listening to uh, a lot of Chief Keef's discography, man. And, and I got to say, mm -hmm. man, I just... Every time I go down a Chief Keef rabbit hole, I just appreciate this man's music and his talent like even more, man. He's just a, you know, I mean, yeah, it's like I don't even know where to start because I because I go through and I just I love the variety, you know, and I just go through and I listen to like the different sounds of the different albums, you know. Obviously, he has Almighty So is from 2013, and that was one of his like leaned out, drugged out records. And that ended up being one of the most influential rap albums of all time. You know, when you, you see the influence that it had on the new wave, like on the on the little Uzis and the famous Dexes and the Playboy Cardis, it's incredible, man. Um, you know, you and I have have songs from Back from the Dead too that we, you know, bob our heads to, man. The moral, <laughs> you know, that album. Glory is the glory. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, the moral <laughs> gang, gang. Yeah, man. I mean, oh, unbelievable. Black, Back from the Dead 2, such a weird album, man. It's one of the most experimental rap albums of all time. And I think what makes Chief Keef great, too, right, is that, you know, you look at a guy like Future, right? And you could say, like, you know, Future has been influential, yes. But you look at a guy like Future and the beats that he, just think about even just the beats that he raps over, right? It's like anybody, you could take him off and put anyone on those, you know? But musical critics have actually talked about albums like Back from the Dead 2 and and things like that where Chief Keef has actually produced a lot of the beats on there. And they have stated, and I agree with this, that it's like the tracks are almost, they're made to frame Chief Keef's vocals, you know? And to me, that just makes him unique. That's like a compliment. It's like, yeah, you can't just put anybody, you can't take Chief Keef off and just put anybody over this beat. It wouldn't work, you know? Right, um, right. You know, just the the journey that he went on, man, you know, because you have that Almighty So that was like crazy leaned out album. Then Back from the Dead 2, he has this weird psychedelic, like, you know, weird experimental drill album. Then right after that, a couple months later, he came out with Nobody, which is a which a lot of people say that's like Chief Keef's 808s and Heartbreaks. I almost think of it as Chief Keef's Yeezus. Um, that album's just very um it's one of his bleakest albums. It's a very like moody, a pretty depressing album, actually. Like there's a very dark mm. undertone to that album. He's really like going into his subconscious on that album. Interestingly enough, that album has a feature by Kanye West. And I think Kanye West helped with a lot of the production on that album. And the cover is actually the, the dropout bear, but like a chief key version of it, which I always thought was kind of interesting. Um, yes. you know, and then in 2015, it comes out with, um, you know, sorry for the weight, which was like a, a nod to little Wayne, but he spelled it weight, like, uh, pounds, you know, but it was like a nod to uh, mm. the cover even looks like Lil Wayne's mixtape series because Chief Keef's like a massive Wayne fan. Um, yes. You know, in that year, that mixtape and then Bang 3, both of those, he uh, was on like this. He sounds like Lil Wayne in 2015 on all of his projects in 2015. He has he does like those Wayne voice inflections. It's super interesting. You could tell he's somebody that gets obsessed with something you know he's like an ultra creative where he gets obsessed with something and he's like i want to recreate that he's like on something for a long time and then he gets bored with it and does something else you know um but yeah man and and then i didn't mention bang too but that actually came out before almighty so and that's like a little that was back in the lean era that was super inf <laughs> influential as well but that that's like a more lo-fi version of almighty so but anyway i'm droning on about chief keef and nowadays he just makes these as he it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in 2017. The guy the serves. The guy that serves that. Oh, yeah. But then in like 2017 and pretty much since then, he became lyrical again because for a while he was just, he said that he was put lyricism kind of on the back burner and was just going for Sonic and a very direct approach where he's just kind of being very direct with his lyrics and not using a lot of wordplay and things like that. He has dispensed with that and since 2017 he's been doing like i mean little wayne level brilliant wordplay you know where where it's like oh fuck that's clever like every line is like oh my god that's that's super clever you know anyway i love him in about a week if he doesn't delay it for like the fifth time uh almighty so too is slated to drop so I'm looking forward yeah, to right. that. Keep, yeah, I feel like you've mentioned that that thing's dropping a few times. Dude, he's he keeps pushing it back. It's crazy, man. Um, but I can't even knock him, dude. If he's just, you know, he's probably like Kanye where he just wakes up and re-records the entire album one day. I mean, you know, shit. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Musical End, just been on a freaking Chief Keef binge. Uh, and then on the movie side of things, let me get my letter boxed up here real quick um do, do, do. okay so i saw uh white men can't jump uh, the, the new version like the 
The new version. Okay, how was that? Oh, it was pretty good. It was all right. I didn't hate it. I didn't okay. love it. I, th- I thought it was. I gave it three stars. Six out of ten. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I, th- I thought it was good. It was a nice time. It's very feel good movie. I liked it. Um, mm-hmm. Not too much to say about it. Then I watched sixty five with Adam Driver. Oh, the Adam Driver movie. Okay. Yeah, with dinosaurs and everything. Yeah. Uh, honestly, man, I should have listened to the critics because this movie is crap. Um, really? Like, my advice to any filmmakers who are going to make a dinosaur movie, use the fucking dinosaurs and maybe put more than just two species of dinosaurs in your movie. You know? How about that? Mm-hmm. That's what I have to say about 65. Um, it was. I think I see. I think I saw, obviously, I haven't obviously I haven't seen the movie, but I think I saw like the YMS review of it, and Oof. he was very negative about it. Yeah, it, it's really bad, man. And the whole like this whole Logan Last of Us thing with like the the man, the older man, and then this like young girl cre- creating like a surrogate father daughter relationship on this journey. That is to stop. That that was so freaking forced in this movie. Like, th- there's a moment where they're walking through the woods, and she's walking behind him, and she just starts like chucking berries at the back of his neck, and and I'm like, oh, here they go. They're trying to build up this father daughter silly, you know, banter yeah. relationship, and I was just like, ah, yeah. And then. Uh, I rewatched Upgrade, um, the 2018 uh, cyberpunk quasi body horror film. You said, by, you said you rewatched it. Yeah, I've seen it before. I rewatched it. Okay. Um, okay. And yeah, not too much to say. That's a great film. I recommend that to people. Uh, it's it's the guy who directed the latest Invisible Man movie, which was also great. Um, yeah, that was great. Lee Wanell, who is the screenwriter he's of, funny. yeah, he's the screenwriter of Saw and Insidious, and now he's moved into the directing space, and he's been doing a great job. He's got two great movies, in my opinion, great genre films. Um, but Upgrade's good. It's a cyberpunk film, basically about a guy who gets in. Uh, him and his wife are in a car accident, and then they get um, attacked by a gang. His wife during the attack gets murdered and then he gets paralyzed. And so this billionaire offers him <clears throat> basically to implant him with like a Neuralink type device, brain chip thing mm-hmm. called STEM, which will uh, allow him to walk again and, and even give him enhanced physical abilities. So, of course, the first thing he does is goes on a mission to track down the guys who murdered his wife and get revenge. Uh, and get answers. Uh, so it's a great high concept, like, yeah, that sounds awesome kind of thing. So, uh, And it's great. It is awesome. Mm. And you've seen that before, right? No, I've never seen that movie. I know that you've seen it because I think you saw it like when we were still in college. Yeah. But I've, I've not taken it upon myself to watch Upgrade. <sighs> it's a good one, man. It's great. I, I, you know, upon the rewatch especially, I noticed like, couple of plot holes that bothered me and stuff but other than that it's it's they're not completely like debilitating to it i mean it's still a great film um mm-hmm. speaking of great films i rewatched no country for old men um yeah, what can i say that what hasn't you, already been said you feel yeah. i loved it man i mean shit i always do but uh you yeah. know hey uh no, again Nothing I can say hasn't already been said about No Country for Old Men. It's great. Super suspenseful. The suspense is palpable. I'll, I'll say that. Um, one of the best mm-hmm. examples of suspense in cinema, in my opinion, and expert storytelling as well. And then the last thing I yeah. saw, hey, the last thing I saw before this uh, podcast was uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Um, that's right you watched <laughs> black man they were kind of forever yeah um so first of all you know touching like really touching tribute to chadwick boseman um he's actually from um 
the town that I grew up in, uh, or I don't know if he's, yeah, no, he is from Greenville, South Carolina. Um, that's the town that I grew up in. Um, let me fact check myself on that real quick here. Chadwick Bozeman, um, Anderson, South Carolina. So he's from the same, same area. Um, but yeah, it was a touching tribute to Chadwick Bozeman, man. That, that was, you know, uh, that was a tragedy, man. That was really sad. And and they do a really good job of, mm-hmm. of paying tribute to him in the movie. And, and it really, mm-hmm. um, it, it was touching, man. Um, the movie itself is, is a complete mess. I, I did not care for it. Um, there's just so much wrong, um, just on a story level, on a execution level, on, on pretty much every level for me. Uh, I just, could barely get through it man but so i just didn't care for the film but i did think it was a really nice tribute to chadwick boseman Mm -hmm. um and then okay yeah man and then lastly uh uh as far as television goes um i'm almost done with the mr robot show and i'm on the final Mm -hmm. season and i have to say dude the final season of mr robot is some of the best television ever it's some of the best television I've ever seen. Really? Like, dude, it's so yeah. amazing. Like, it's it's so good, dude. Oh, my God. Every episode is a fucking home run. Like, I'm just like, oh, that was a great episode. Man, that was a real standout. Next one. Holy shit, that episode was fucking awesome. That was a standout, too. Rinse and repeat. Hit after home run after home run after home run. Every episode of the final season. Incredible. I'm like shouting at my TV like a lunatic during every episode. It, it's it's amazing television. It's some of the best I've ever seen. Yeah. So good. Wow, that's incredibly high praise. Oh God, it says man. Edward about a show that he he will likely say that he will watch <laughs> and not watch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recommend it, man. It's one of the goats for a reason, um, and it's more of a recent goat so to speak um it it's not an old show by any means i think it ended in uh 2019 or something like that i i know it started in like 2015 i think but um man it's 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 one of the greats dude holy shit so good um and then final season of barry uh which i need to watch the fi- i the, i i've seen all of it except for the series finale, which premiered this past, I think Sunday night, I still need to watch it. So I've been avoiding all spoilers like on the internet or whatever. I just haven't had time to watch it. Um, but I'm really excited. The final season has been great and I'm really sad that it's ending, but I can't wait to see how they end it. And that's my recap. Hey dude. Well, having recapped all of that, what do you say? And what do you say, listener, that we all get into the movie of the week? I say, which is let's do great, it. Yes, which is the great um, Denis Villeneuve's film. Um, and I'm not saying the movie's great. I'm saying Denis Villeneuve's great. Um, and it's the film Enemy from 2013, directed by Denis Villeneuve and written by Javier Guyon. Um And it is an adaptation of a novel called The Double. Now, Mr. Jake, what did you think about Enemy? Well, Edward, I am somebody who's a very big fan of Denis Villeneuve. And I had not seen a movie by Denis Villeneuve that I did not like, that I did not love yes. until I saw Enemy. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about it. What you, tell me about your feelings. I Man, I'm sorry, man. I, I did not like this film. Um, I, it's okay. I was just waiting for this movie to end, man. Um, and I can see it because I remember, wow, okay. I knew this was a rewatch for you um, because I remember, yes. I think it was some point in college where I was like, 
we were like trying to decide on a movie and I was like, oh, we could watch Enemy. And you were like, ah, that's a pretty good movie, but I, I just don't feel like watching that right now, man. Like, I just don't. And I could do it. I can definitely see that. I can sympathize with that feeling about this movie. Now. <laughs> yeah. Um, dude, I just. I, so I will say this. Like, the first. I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. I just didn't like it. Um, the. The first mm. act is actually pretty good, I thought. Um, there's a lot yeah, of intrigue. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. There's interesting build up, and I'm like, you know, oh shit, this is getting this is weird. You know, it starts making you think. You're like, okay, this guy's got a doppelganger. Yeah. That's weird. You start thinking about the implications of that. You start thinking of weird questions yeah. like, would I recognize myself? <laughs> it's like that movie Another Earth. Would I recognize myself? You yeah. know, if I saw myself, uh, you know, and like what? You know, if I saw myself in a movie, you know, like, would I recognize myself? You know, if I saw myself across the street, you know, because there's actually a thing that I've heard where, you know, you likely wouldn't recognize yourself on the street, like right away, because you're mostly used to seeing yourself in a mirror, which is actually a, obviously a reversed image of you. So you actually don't have necessarily a fantastic idea of what you actually look like to other people. You're more used to your reflection. Um, anyway, mm. started thinking about stuff like that and it, and it, you know, gets the mind working that first act and it gets you pumped for like, okay, what's going to happen. Right. Right. And then nothing happens. <laughs> like okay. it, it, at least it was the way I, that's the way I felt where I, I was mm. just waiting for, something and it just felt like act one kept repeating itself where it was just like okay there's a lot of intrigue mm -hmm. in act one but then it's like the Which intrigue is interesting that you say that yeah. but then yeah then it's like the intrigue continues in act two and then the intrigue continues in act three and then it's like oh they're dead yeah and then there's that weird ending it, with it, the spider that you say that and that yeah was, it's interesting that you say that because go ahead you know because denny said that like in in he 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 quoted saying that this is like a movie about repetition to him. It's kind of just like a movie about you know the same shit happening over and over. Um, and it's interesting that he said that that you were like, yeah. oh, this is just this fucking thing just felt like it was just the same <laughs> thing again and again and again. Um, ah, I guess I'm validated. This movie, this, yeah, the, yeah, you are. The thing that, the thing that fascinated me about this movie way back then when I first watched it were just those spiders. Because everything that I saw about that movie was just like spiders over skyscrapers and spiders and spiders, you know. Yeah. So I was just like really – so I was just fascinated. I was like, what's going on, you know? And this was another movie that I believe that was on my radar because of Chris Stockman. Because he actually has like a – like a if you put Enemy on YouTube, one of the videos that will come up is his um, analysis, which I have watched. Um, so I became like very familiar with the movie. It's fascinating because, like you said, back when I first watched this movie, I was just like, this is good. Because I couldn't deny the movie was good. You know, I couldn't deny that about the movie. I was like, this is a good movie. Yeah. It was just very slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, even for an hour and a half movie, it's like slow. And and you really kind of start just kind of being like, please, you know, please, you know. Yeah. Because even when they meet in the, even when they meet in that fucking hotel room and, and the, protagonist Gillen Hall just realizes that the other Gillen Hall is kind of like a douche. You're kind of like, oh, where is this going to go? You know, yeah. what's going to happen? You know, but like you said, then he just like sees his wife and he's just like, ah, I like this guy's wife. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and then they crash, they die, you know, so it's like, okay. So it, it kind of leaves you with like a strange feeling. Um, but that ending to this day fascinates me, you know. With the spider? It fascinates me to this day. The spider ending, you know, where he wakes up with Anthony's wife and the pregnant wife. And he sees that he has that key to that, like, nightclub, like, dungeon that, he, that he's, like, like, going to. And... That he's like, I'm going, you know, and then when he comes back, there's that huge spider and it just kind of like, you know, it's like scared of him, you know. Yeah. So it fascinates me, you know, and I and that's something that I've still not 
found like a very satisfying kind of like response to it and that's why i wanted to rewatch the movie and i wanted to talk to you about that because it's like what what do you what 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 do you think about that stuff like wh where do you land on that you know what's your interpretation of the whole women and spiders thing yeah. well I, i'm kind of stuck yeah I, i'm kind of stuck on the spider thing i mean i haven't i didn't go i probably should have gone and looked up like <laughs> <I'm stuck. laughs> yeah i i probably should have gone and looked up like um interpretations of, of the film um i kind of like forgot about it to be honest I, I, it feels like i showed up without my homework a little bit but but as so far it's been as a minute since so watched this thing, yeah. But as far as I mean, look, yeah. like as far as the, as far as the stuff with, um, you know, his wife and and the other one's wife and all of that stuff, like that was actually pretty interesting. I, I think they're dealing with some interesting ideas here because what I got from that mm. movie, like I've been someone right who, in my past, I've been in like a long time ago now. But I've been in a long, you know, like relationship, right? And you know, I remember toward the end of that relationship feeling like I'm like, man, monogamy is because I think this is a film about mm -hmm. mono a, a look. I think that's a big topic of this film is monogamy and the implications yeah. of monogamy. Because yeah. I was just like, yeah. man, I I remember toward the end of this relationship just being like, I just want to step out and. You know, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't even be saying this. One day when I have a girlfriend who like listens to this episode and is like, "Oh fuck," but whatever. Oh god, <laughs> I'll take this out. <laughs> <laughs> right, but but it's like I remember like thinking like, "Ah oh, god," but well, I don't think so. I don't think you have to because what I'm trying to say, this wasn't a good uh, toward the end of this relationship. The relationship had soured at this point. I think that's an important point to make. So at this point, the relationship had soured and. Of course, when a relationship sours, so does the a lot of times the attraction, <laughs> uh, which goes first is uh, is you know could go either way. Maybe the attraction goes first and then it sours, or maybe it sours and then the attraction leaves. Uh, in this case, right. uh, the relationship had soured and then the attraction started to go away. And and you know I remember just feeling like a little bit stuck. Like I was like I don't. Yeah, you know, uh, it's like I don't want to break up with her, but I also don't want to be here, kind of thing, and just that overwhelming sometimes feeling of like, oh my god, if I could just spend, go on a date with another woman, you know, if I could just go spend an evening with another woman, you know what I mean? And it's just like if I could just live someone else's life for like a day, you know what I mean? And I think that is. Mm. I think this film tackles that subject and it's a tricky subject. It's kind of taboo because what's interesting about the human species is that our brains uh, don't even have a uh, monogamous um, uh, piece, I guess. I I'm trying to word this correctly, but um, mm -hmm. I think there's a, sp I, I believe that like there's only a couple of species of primates that have an actual part of their brain devoted to monogamy. I think it's like maybe bonobos or something like that and certain types of monkeys, but humans, Bonobo. yeah, but yeah. humans, yeah, Zaboomafu, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but humans, <laughs> but humans don't have it. And it's interesting because I think like, no matter, you know, this is a taboo topic, but it's like, there are a lot of men out there, man. Who have just been in relationships for a long time, who've been married for a long time, who no matter how much, you know, they might love like their wife or whoever they're with, it's like they're just wired to, you know, try all, you know, like a variety. You know what I mean? I'm trying to be as like nice and not, you know, not, I'm not trying to come out cross like, uh, like I'm red pill or like Andrew Tate or anything like that. Like, I'm just saying yeah. this is, you know, psychology is not for it. Not everybody. I'm, I'm sure there's exceptions, but right. I think this movie explores that taboo subject very effectively. Yeah. Um, and I could relate it's to like, it on that level because of the, those, you know, shitty relationships that i've been in yeah because interestingly enough like that's what jake gillenhall said he, th he believed the movie was about um 
yeah. he said that he thought the movie, not necessarily that, but he said the the he, he kind of said it in more simple terms because he said that he thought the movie was about just like a guy who married with a pregnant wife and was having an affair at the same time. Um, yeah. So he he said he said he believed that that was what the movie was about, which basically gets into what you're saying. The other Jake you know, Denis Villeneuve has like refused. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The other yeah, Denis Villeneuve has like refused to really like elaborate on the movie too much. He just kind of keeps really saying just like confusing like oh, it's about the repetition, oh, it's about the subconscious. And funnily enough, um, or rather interestingly enough, they they made all of the cast members write um, non like non disclosure agreements or whatever it is. Um, they had to write the MDAs or whatever they, they call them. Um, but they had to sign those, stating that they would not talk about what the meaning of the spider is in the film. Wow! Because Denis Villeneuve has refused to talk about it, and he has refused to even have the actors like even mention what the idea of that is. And the thing that fascinates me about it is because there's also like a there's also kind of like a political element to the movie or like a geopolitical element to the movie kind of more underlying the film. And people have spoken or there's people who've said that the spiders have to do more with the political elements of the film rather than like the character psychology elements of the film. It's strange. Um, this is a movie like this movie fascinates me. I don't think it's great necessarily. I do think it's like a very good film. Um, and it fascinates me. It's because it has like all these elements, you know. And it fascinates me within Villeneuve's phonography because it feels like it's not even like a Villeneuve movie in in that way. Yeah. Where it feels like it almost feels like it's a weird French movie, if you get what I'm saying. Like it feels like a foreign film. And, it does. And it doesn't feel and it doesn't feel like a film that he made. It almost feels like a film that was made by those guys that made the movie Amelie. You know what I'm talking about? It's funny. Yeah, it's funny you say that. And um, what's the other one? Delicatessen or whatever? Because Delicatessen. Yeah, yes. because it almost does feel like that. Even just on a baser, because I mean, you know, there's plenty of reasons for you to say that. But even just on like a baser sort of very superficial level, the just the warm color palette mm -hmm. of that is like very yes. French film feeling where like if you watch yes. like those yes. movies Amelie, Delicatessen, Leon the Professional, like French films like that, yes. they always have very yes. warm color palettes. Yes. So it was very strange and I didn't know if it was the Villeneuve, like Villeneuve never worked with that cinematographer again. Um, and not saying that they had like a negative collaboration, but I think he was just like looking for something very specific with this film, you know, like, like we said, it, it like has this like French look to it. And it has like this like really slow stall pace where it's like shots linger for maybe longer than they should, you know, yeah. and the movie feels like just like this parable, you know, it almost feels like, like, um, <laughs> there's like a weird combination of just like French and like Spanish filmmaking yeah. that just and it makes the movie just feel like foreign, you know? Um, and it's interesting because originally Denis wanted to cast Javier Bardem to play the roles of um, mm. the Jake Gyllenhaal ended up playing, which is interesting um, because this movie is actually funded it's like partly like french and spanish funded which i think adds like more to this um that those countries were the ones that provided funding for this film um and that he initially offered the lead role to javier van der bardem and he just didn't take it because he said that he felt he wasn't suited for the character there's very fascinating stuff with this movie um yeah and it, this movie just always kind of feels like a little bit of like a puzzle to me that i watched the movie and I feel like I get an idea about something and then I, I feel like I'm not all the way there. And it's one of those movies where I feel, I wish that I could have like a, a, a dinner with Denis Villeneuve and have him drink more than he thought he would. <laughs> and then be like, Denis, what the fuck's up with those spiders, man? You got to tell me, you know, like, what's up with that movie? What were you doing in that movie? Um, <laughs> That's our goal then. We got to get yeah. De Denis Villeneuve on the podcast and get him drunk <laughs> to tell us what the Denis meaning of the spiders dude. is. <laughs> Like listen, like listen to listen to this. Like he made a movie called. He's made a bunch of movies, um, but I've I've all, I've seen most of them except the first two. He made a movie called August Thirty Second on Earth, which doesn't is it wasn't like received very positively. 
Um, and he made a movie in the 90s, in 1998. He made a movie called Maelstrom in 2000, which is the same thing. Like, it just, people don't really talk about it. Um, and he made Polytechnic in 2009. I've seen Polytechnic. I think it's a good movie. I think it's a rough movie. I actually would not recommend people to watch that movie because it deals with, specifically, it deals with um, the 1989 Ecole Polytechnic Massacre. Um, known as the Montreal Massacre. It's like a, a massacre that happened in Canada. Rough movie. I would not recommend people to watch that movie specifically, but uh, if if you want to watch him take on that subject in 2009, um, I I say go ahead. It's a good movie. Um, he made Incendies in 2010. I haven't seen it in Incendies. Of all of his movies, Incendies is the only movie that I'm missing and the only movie that I actually do want to watch. I don't want to watch the other ones. Like the ones made in the 80, 1998 and 2000. Yeah. But look at this run, dude. 2013, he makes Prisoners and Enemy, same year. <laughs> 2015, Sicario. 2016, Arrival. 2017, Blade Runner 2049. 2021, Dune. 2023, Dune Part 2. This guy's insane. Dude, he's a legend. Insane. He's an this absolute deserves, legend. Like, all, uh, he deserves everything, dude. All of the praise, all of the awards, everything. Yeah, and I think um, I think he's on his way to becoming the next Kubrick. I don't think people have said that about Nolan. I don't think Nolan. I, think so. I don't think Nolan. I'm not saying Nolan doesn't have that talent or anything. I just don't think Nolan's. I think Nolan's a different type of filmmaker. I don't think he makes movies like Kubrick. Yeah. I think people started to draw that comparison because of maybe Memento, which if he kept making movies like that, I could see the yeah. comparison. And then people, yeah, people revise that comparison because of interstellar but again interstellar is a very mm. different film than type of movie than 2001 with what it's trying to do yeah i don't think i certainly think that christopher nolan is his stuff is more highbrow than like a, a michael bay or something he's certainly dealing with interesting themes and subject matter and and his movies are really thoughtful but i don't think he's that type of filmmaker I think Denis Villeneuve is that type of filmmaker, um, like Kubrick, especially with this uh, with this movie, especially um, and but with, but with with all of his movies um, that I've seen anyway. Um, I could see him being on track to be being the next Kubrick of our generation. I agree. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, and and I I did want to say, and I think I. I believe this is the type of film like Kubrick films. And I believe enemy, despite not really liking it this time around, I do believe that this is probably the type of film that gets better each time you watch it. Like I think I, my, my prediction is if I ever watch this movie again, I think I'll like it better the second Mm -hmm. time that happened with Dune as well. I actually liked Dune. I've seen Dune twice now. I I actually like Dune on the more on the second watch. I I, bumped it up. I've really been meaning to watch that movie again. Um, I've been meaning to watch that movie again for those exact same reasons. Because I feel like I, I, would, I could come out of that thinking similarly. Um, yeah, because what happens and on that's s- how I came out of Enemy. Yeah. I was just going to say real quick, what happens on a second viewing is that your preconceptions are gone. You know? Right. Your expectations exactly. and preconceptions and, and, are gone. Yeah. And, that, and that's how I came out of watching Enemy the second time. Where I don't believe I necessarily, I don't believe I'm going to rate this movie differently than what I did before, but I do have a greater appreciation for it, um, and it intrigues me. I I probably will watch this again, like probably within the next year, um, just because the movie this movie fascinates me, you know, because I think there's more than there meets the eye, and in, in rewatching the movie, I had a better experience with it because I wasn't like, because <clears throat> like you, I watched this movie after I had already seen Sicario and I had already seen um, Prisoners, you know, so I had like a preconceived notion about it, like you said, and watching it now, knowing exactly kind of what I was getting into, I had, I had a better experience with the film. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I, I do think, I just want to reiterate real quick, like I do think um, this film is tackling some interesting topics, uh, particularly that I agree with Jake Gyllenhaal, the other Jake, <laughs> that mm-hmm. <laughs> this is, I do believe that that's the main idea of this movie is the struggle um, that people, men and women, I mean, may or may not have with monogamy. 
and it tackles that taboo mm. subject. Um, I'll give it that, you know, that it has the balls to tackle that subject, which, you know, it's not a crazy, insanely brave subject to tackle by any means. I mean, I use the term taboo right. loosely. It's not that taboo. Um, but right. I mean, I, dude, I remember like when my relation, my long relationship a long time ago now had soured, like, you know, I remember like, you know, having crushes, dude, like a little schoolboy, And then like, <laughs> I remember Googling, yeah. like I, dude, I literally remember Googling, is it okay to have a crush while you're in a relationship? And there's like a whole, there was like this, I yeah. remember this article I read where it's like, it's perfectly fine to have a crush while you're in a relationship. It can be fun. It's interesting. It just mm. can't become real, you know? And I, and I remember reading that and just being like, oh my God, this is so lame. You know, like, <laughs> why can't this article mm. validate <laughs> me more? You know, like, mm. uh, cause mm. it, it, it validated that. But I, I just, I remember reading that article and just becoming like frustrated. I was just like, is it really not okay to wander off the reservation like i, I don't know like people struggle with it man mm. let's mm. let's call it for what it is yeah. like not everybody but men and women alike right have struggled and will continue to struggle with being with the same yeah. motherfucker <laughs> for four decades yeah. or longer and yes. yeah you know hearing their same laugh and hearing their same talking points and they're saying looking at their same yeah. face you know for decades on end like yeah. you know yeah yeah i'm not crazy yeah, for bringing for saying but that, you know no 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 and neither neither is this, obviously this movie for like creating kind of like this allegories around these things um and hopefully we'll both rewatch this at some point again and see what we have to say, uh, whether it's different or whether we know what's up with those fucking spiders. In any case, I think, Brian, you both, me and you, will do what I was shitting on uh, earlier in this episode and probably watch some analysis videos. <laughs> like, what is what is this up? What's up here? Go yeah. on. <laughs> exactly. But, yeah. What would you rate this movie, sir, on your first watch of it? Um, I give it two stars out of five. Four really? out of ten, yeah. Okay. I used to... Okay. Two stars out of five? Is that what it is? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I stay with my 3.5 stars out of five. So basically a seven out of ten. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> and that being said, um, I don't have any more trivia than the ones that I said. Um, I couldn't find anything else. This movie has like pretty close doors. Um, what do you have for us, mister, for next week? Well, Edward, you know, over the past uh, month or so, we've been, you know, on this this trend, man. We've been watching horror and sci-fi and serious shit like Enemy <laughs> and scary shit like Skin of And I thought, you know what? Let's lighten it up because my pick for next week yeah. is the classic stoner comedy. It's Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Wow. <laughs> have you seen that movie? I have never seen that movie. I know you haven't either, right? Okay. No, I have not. I saw you hadn't logged it on Letterboxd, wow. so I was like, well, unless Edward yeah. just forgot to log this. Because uh, I was like, you know what? These old stoner comedies, man, they're fun. And I haven't seen that many of them, yeah. you know? But yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm excited. I've never seen that movie. Never. And to be honest, if you had not put it out there for us to see it, I probably would have never seen it. Um, <laughs> Keanu Reeves. Um, I forget the name of the other actor. Uh, no, I don't remember. But I'm very excited. Hell yeah. yeah. But that's it. That's it for this week, think, ladies and gentlemen. I think, oh, go ahead. I think, I, I think uh, uh, what's his name? The comedian um, is in there. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, who is this? Uh, what's his name? Bill and Ted's Excellent What's his Adventure. Name? Ah. Do, do, do. I'm going to pull I it up right now. I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of that guy. We're going to have it okay, in like five you. seconds. Ah, <laughs> um, I can't believe I'm blanking on that. Alex Winter. Yeah, Alex Winter is the name of that guy. But you know you know the, the comedian that's in that movie? There's a comedian. Like oh, a George Carlin. Comedian. Oh, he's in this? I didn't know he George was in Carling. this. George Carlin, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying, dude. George Carling's in there. Oh shit! I'm even more excited for this now. I didn't know he was in this. Yeah, I love George Carlin. Excited. George Carlin's awesome. I'm very excited. Hell yeah! Okay. Well, tune in uh, next week, everybody. We're gonna lighten it up and 
get high because it's Bill and Ted's excellent adventure <laughs> next week, folks. <laughs> Okay, next time on Fin Tunnels, we are out. Peace.